Affairs Committee with uh, uh, Regent Butker. Thank you. Recording in progress. This, can I just set that right there? Welcome, everybody. Uh, I think everybody's here, it looks like, on the screen. Um, the first item, well, I'll do the roll call so that we know that everybody's here. Um, Regent Bates. Here. Provost Jose Raris. I think you're muted. Sorry, Regent, uh, yes, here. There you go, there you go. Um, and the Provost Kriegel. Present. And Assistant Provost uh, Anne-Marie Vanders, Andy. Present. Anne-Marie is here. Yes, and Chief Academic Officer Rachel Boone is here. Yes. Down at the table and I'm here. So welcome everybody. The first item of business is the minutes. Does anybody have any changes to the minutes? Seeing none, we'll just approve those by general consent. This morning, our agenda includes a number of program requests. That's basically it. So we will start um, with uh, the UNI program requests, the new program request for Bachelor of Arts in Criminology and Criminal Justice. Uh, good morning, Regent Chair Butiker, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, before you this morning are, are two requests from the University of Northern Iowa. The first is to add a modality to an existing program, uh, and the second, a termination request for a Bachelor's of Applied Sciences program. Uh, with your permission, Regent Chair Butiker, I would like to just consider these together, but unless you want me to separate them out. No, that's just fine. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the first request is to add an online modality to an existing um, uh, Bachelor of Arts in Criminology and Criminal Justice program, as I mentioned. Uh, this request is being made uh, to meet the needs of many working and often placebound professionals uh, who have earned an Associates of Arts degree from a community college and need an affordable path to earn a BA in criminal justice from a Regents institution. Uh, if approved, uh, this would be the only online criminal justice program offered by a Regents institution. And particularly with our uh, partnership with DMAC, it would be offered at the community college tuition rate. So I think that would be very, um, uh, uh, would be good for the students that uh, can uh, take advantage of this pathway. Uh, in addition, because we already offer a, a BAS degree, uh, applied science degree in criminal justice, and because of the current structure of our major and our rotation of course offerings, uh, adding the BA version of the online program would not materially add to the faculty workload uh, or the overall curriculum. Uh, the second request <clears throat> is to terminate a dormant program that because of staffing changes and, and lackluster student interest uh, never really uh, enrolled students in the first place. Uh, we're requesting to terminate the BAS and tactical emergency services with the vulnerable populations. And as you see in your notes, the program uh, never enrolled any students and we're requesting to terminate this program as part of our annual effort to clean up our catalog. And I'll be happy to address any questions if there are any. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing there are no questions without objection, then the committee will recommend approval of the Bachelor of Arts in Criminology and Criminal Justice online at UNI, and will terminate the Bachelor of Applied Science in Tactical Emergency Services and Vulnerable Populations. Thank you. Okay, the next is uh, the University of Iowa. Um, the need, the program requests the University of Iowa. Pro Provost Kriegel, will you present those? Uh, Associate Provost Tony Uden Holman will be presenting these couple of uh, changes. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to start with the Bachelor of Business Administration in Risk Management and Insurance. The Department of Finance in the Tippie College of Business is proposing a new undergraduate major, a BBA in Risk Management and Insurance, RMI, which will require a minimum of 120 semester hours 
which includes general education courses, the business core, and 22 hours of work specifically in the major, including at least two experiential learning opportunities. The coursework will focus on the skills necessary to be immediately employable in core RMI roles and provide the foundation necessary for future leadership positions. As we look at workforce demands, Iowa has the ninth largest insurance industry in the US with annual economic activity of over 18.6 billion in 2020. And in October, 2021, Iowa had the second highest concentration of insurance industry workers of any state in the country. Additionally, key stakeholders in Iowa have expressed the importance of training skilled workers in the risk management and insurance industry. The Department of Finance is well prepared to offer the major. In 2004, the Tippie College of Business created the Emmett J. Bond Institute of Risk Management and Insurance to support the development of a certificate program in RMI. In 2017, the Bond Institute and its RMI certificate received the Global Center of Insurance Excellence designation from the International Insurance Society. The Vaughn Institute and the Department of Finance have the necessary expertise and personnel and the existing facilities are sufficient. No reallocations from other programs or areas of the university are needed to offer the major. Given the national profile of the Vaughn Institute, we anticipate the RMI major will attract new students to the university and then current BBA students may choose it as their primary degree. As noted in Form A, the department projects steady growth from 10 students in year one to 140 in year student in the year seven. Additionally, students in TIPI with primary majors in marketing, business analytics, management, and accounting could benefit from adding the RMI as a secondary major. And finally, the RMI may appeal to majors outside of TIPI as well to add as a secondary major. I would note that the enrollment in the RMI certificate program has ranged from 67 to 110 over the past several years. No university in the state of Iowa currently offers a full-scale RMI major. Drake currently offers a minor, and we have letters of support from both ISU and UNI. Finally, TIPI is reviewed every five years as part of the Association to Advance Collegiate Schools of Business continuous program review process, and the new RMI major will be included in that review. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has. Are there any questions? We appreciate all the background information that we received on all of these requests, but seeing no questions then, if there's no objections, the committee will recommend approval of the Bachelor of Business Administration and Risk Management and Insurance. And the Master of Health, well, we're gonna do the Master of Health Science next, okay. Thank you. So the university is also pre proposing the creation of a Master of Science in Health Services and Policy Research, which would be offered by the Department of Health Management and Policy in the College of Public Health. The proposed program includes a minimum of 30 semester hours of coursework. Students will also complete a final research project. The proposed program is designed to provide students with content knowledge and methodological skills pertaining to the practice of health services research. They'll acquire theoretical knowledge of US health policy, health economics, and the organization and delivery of health services, as well as a range of analytical skills, which will allow them to design and execute health services research studies. The vision of the program is to be nationally recognized for preparing graduates for a variety of careers in applied settings. We also think that the program could appeal to clinicians who are interested in adding health services research skills as they work at larger settings, including academic medical centers. Also, we believe this could be very beneficial for students who are interested in going on to doctoral fields of study. And I would note that the program is designed in such a way that allows students in the department's PhD in health services and policy program to earn the MS degree as they complete coursework and exam requirements for the PhD program. The department is very well prepared to offer the proposed program. Current departmental faculty are available to provide the coursework, mentor students on research projects, and provide advising. Additionally, the current facilities are adequate. No real allocations from the college or the university will be needed to offer the program. Enrollment in the proposed program is expected to increase over time, with a minimum of two students entering during the first year 
and growing to five students entering during the fifth year of operation with a target of 10 to 15 students. And there are no plans to offer this via distance education. No other university in the state offers an MS in health services and policy research. I would note that the University of Iowa College of Pharmacy offers a sub-program in health services research as part of its MS and PhD programs. And while the sub-programs sub in pharmacy share some of the same attributes, um, there is a distinct difference in outcomes between the two programs that are discipline specific. Um, both Iowa State and UNI provided letters of support and there were no comments posted to the ICCPHSE listserv. Finally, I would just note that the College of Public Health is accredited by the Council on Education for Public Health. And since the proposed degree falls under the college, it will be part of that accreditation process. Happy to answer any questions you have. This is actually a proposal from my home department. So um, that's something I'm a bit more familiar with because of that. Great, thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, Regent Lindemar. I, I have a question. Um, given the meager projections on enrollment, does this involve the development of new courses or is it merely a realignment uh, and rearrangement of coursework, existing okay. courses? That's a great question. Actually, it's really um, the packaging of existing coursework. As was noted in the proposal, students who are, for example, in the current PhD program, these are really the base courses that they take to provide them with that foundational knowledge. So it does not, um, it does not involve the creation of new courses. And that's also, to be honest, this is never going to be a, a large program, but I really do think that it will meet a need we do have some clinicians, um, for example, that are interested in really upping their skills analytically. And I think this MS program would provide them the opportunity to do so without necessarily having to commit to a doctoral program. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none then um, with the committee will recommend approval of the Master of Science in Health Services and Policy Research at the University of Iowa. Thank you. Thank you. Then we have one more exciting item. Right, uh, I'll take this one. Thank you, Regent Butker. Yes, uh, quite good news for uh, the University of Iowa. We are requesting to change the name of the Iowa Center for School Mental Health, which was approved last month to the Scanlon Center for School Mental Health within the College of Education. The purpose of the center is to provide social, emotional, behavioral, and psychological services to schools, not only to aid in COVID-19 recovery, but also to build capacity for both the immediate and future delivery of mental health supports across the entire state. The center is going to bring together educational partners, policymakers, and mental health professionals to serve as a national hub for research to practice implementation related to mental health. The University of Iowa requests that the Iowa Center for School and Mental Health in the University's College of Education be named in honor of the Scanlon Family Foundation's generous gift commitment of $15 million. The transformational gift from the Scanlon Family Foundation is going to support the Iowa Center for School and Mental Health's clinical services, as well as activities and programs of the center that support the mental health needs of veterans, those serving in the military, as well as their families. I'd like to point out that the center is also strongly aligned with our newly implemented strategic plan. Throughout the development phase of the strategic plan, we consistently heard how important the issues of mental health and well-being are for our entire campus community. And so we will now be able to look at ways to leverage the research, education, and training efforts of the center to improve the well-being of our local community as well as the state and the entire world. So, uh, with the Scanlon Center for School Mental Health now exemplifying those efforts, it's to our advantage to be able to advance mental health research and services on the campus, and also to provide much needed social, emotional, behavioral, and psychological services to all of Iowa's K through 12 schools. We're really appreciative of the gift from the Scanlon Family Foundation, and I'm glad to answer any questions. Well, it's very exciting to get this wonderful gift from the Scanlon family, and we totally appreciate it. And I think back to um, a couple of years ago, the student government uh, presented their top concern was really to get uh, better mental health services uh, 
on campus and here we are working to do it across the state. So right. I think it's all very exciting and really appreciate the Scanlon family gift. Do you, any of you have any questions? Okay, if there's no objections, then the committee will recommend approval of the name, the new name of the Scanlon Center for School Mental Health at the University of Iowa. Thank you Thank so you much. Very much. Thank you. Yes. Next, um, finally, we have two program requests from Iowa State, um, Associate Provost Van Der Zand, and uh, can you share these with us? Thank you. Yes, good morning, Regent Butker. Good morning, other um, members of the committee. I'm glad to be here today to talk about the two requests that we have here uh, at Iowa State. The first one is a Bachelor of Science in Climate Science. It will be offered through our uh, Department of Geological and Atmospheric Sciences, which is housed in our College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Uh, the new degree will address the need for a well-trained, adaptable workforce to address the challenges associated with a changing climate. Students will receive a solid foundation in how the climate system works, develop knowledge of the impacts of a changing climate and options for mitigating those impacts, and develop proficiency in data analysis and technical communication. The climate science bachelor's will be an interdisciplinary degree. Uh, it will focus not only on the strengths of the department in meteorology and geology, but also in math, physics, chemistry, communication, and other complementary coursework. Uh, this will also be a strong complement to our outstanding agriculture programs uh, here at Iowa State. As noted in the docket item, the proposed degree will be the first undergraduate climate science degree in Iowa offered by the region's institutions. While both U of I and UNI have programs in environmental science and the U of I has a bachelor's in sustainability science, the thrust of the Iowa State program will be different in that it'll focus on the physical earth system processes as opposed to ecology, social, and urban systems, which are both strengths of the uh, University of Iowa's program. Both you and I and University of Iowa have offered support letters, which we appreciate. Uh, and we appreciate the opportunity to work together, not only with our region partners, but also with Iowa's community colleges as students uh, would prepare and transfer uh, to Iowa State to complete this degree. We conservatively project the new major will attract 25 students in the first year and the increase to 100 students in year four with a sustaining level of approximately 150 students by year seven. Um, as this has worked through the processes here at Iowa State, uh, we're already hearing um, positive uh, um, reach out from the students who are hearing about this as a potential opportunity. So there's, there's some real interest uh, here on our campus. Uh, the program is projected to be financially self-sustaining. The resources for the program will come from student tuition following Iowa State's budget model. Um, the climate science degree program was submitted to the coordinating council listserv back in May. No concerns were raised um, and pending board approval, we would begin marketing the degree to students um, as soon as possible. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have on the Bachelor of Science in Climate Science. Are there any questions? Okay, I would just like to bring up one concern that I have. The, uh, the uh, Bachelor of Science in Climate. Climate change is a very politically charged topic. And I wanna, my main concern is for freedom of speech, that um, students' freedom of speech will be protected and what not. I have, I, as you know, I was in public service for a long time. This is some of the um, materials that I have received concerning climate change, okay? I'm, they're not dog-eared. I haven't studied them uh, a lot, but it's all research on, um, with probably the non-PC uh, opinions, opinions, but it's, it's, documented research. I don't particularly find that real interesting, but a lot of people do, most of you probably do. But anyway, my, my main concern 
is that we are go the extra mile to protect um, freedom of speech for opinions that differ in this politically charged topic. That being said, I'm supportive of this. So do you wanna take on the next, if there are any other comments? I wanna give these books to Iowa State. Rachel will drop them off. Great. Well, thank you, Regent Bucker. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for raising that concern. That certainly is something that we have, uh, you know, talked about and considered. We understand the um, the political nature that some people do view climate change through. Um, certainly, as a research institution, our faculty and our staff that will be involved in that will be really bringing forward the most current um, research as it relates to. Uh, climate, climate change, climate science, the, the intricacies of all the different systems that are involved in this. Um, and certainly uh, freedom of, uh, of expression and free speech are an important part uh, here at Iowa State. We've added that as a required component to our syllabus statement and we'll be sure that we uh, include that as, as, a, as a reminder as, as we move into this space. So all of our faculty are, um, have that top of mind as they begin teaching in these course areas. Great, right, thank you. Go ahead and, and take the next item and then we'll approve them together. Okay, great, thank you. So the second uh, proposal that we have in front of you today is a Bachelor of Arts in Computer Science. It also will be offered in our College of Liberal Arts and Science and it will be offered through our Department of Computer Science. The proposed degree will be offered in addition to our current Bachelor of Science in Computer Science. The proposed BA degree uh, requires fewer total computer science courses, but allows students to spread the breadth of their education across other disciplines, as well as pursue double majors or minors. And it is also expected to enhance uh, the diversity of students who are seeking computer science degrees. I will say that this was a question that came up as this program worked through our faculty senate. And one of the questions was, well, what's the difference between the BA and the BS? And will students still have those core and foundational computer science courses? Um, and we are assured that yes, in fact, they will take those foundational core computer science courses, what are, which are essential to any computer science degree. Where the flexibility will come is they'll be able to take other courses that are focused in uh, data analytics or communication so they can interpret what they're doing with the computer science and being able to communicate it to broader audiences as, as one example. Um, as noted in the docket item, both the University of Iowa and University of Northern Iowa already have BA programs in computer science alongside their BS programs. Most private colleges also have BA programs. And still there's more demand for computer science professionals in the workforce than all of us are supplying with our current programs. Both the University of Iowa and University of Northern Iowa have offered support letters, which we appreciate. We conservatively project the new major will attract 15 students in the first year and increase to 75 students in year four with approximately 130 students by year seven. Uh, we also do anticipate a number of students who will double major with this bachelor's of arts and computer science and in another complementary field. The program's projected to be financially self-sustaining. Resources for the program will come from our student tuition following the Iowa State um, budget model. This program was also posted to the Iowa Coordinating Council listserv in May, received no additional concerns or comments, and pending board approval, the degree will begin marketing uh, in, to students in January of 2023. Happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions concerning this program? Okay, seeing none, if there's no objections, then the committee will recommend approval of the Bachelor of Science in Climate Science and the Bachelor of Arts in Computer Science at Iowa State University. Thank you, Henry. Is there any other business to come before the Academic Affairs Committee? Seeing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.
Thank you, Nancy. Uh, before we start, I'd like to recognize that we have a new region with us, uh, J.C. Riswick. We're looking forward to having you uh, as a member of the board, and uh, we hope that uh, you'll have a chance to meet the other people uh, on the call uh, too. Uh, I think we'll we'll be getting together for just a few minutes after the board meeting to so you can get a chance to talk to everybody. But we welcome you and thank you. Well, we look forward to having you around. You bet. You're not going to stand up and applaud yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. uh, the, the meeting of the Board of Regents State of Iowa for July 27, 2022 will come to order. I'll begin by calling the roll. Regent Dunkel. Here. Regent Barker. Here. Regent Grove. Here. Regent Rouse. Here. Regent Bates. Here. Regent Lindemeyer. Here. Regent Butker. Here. Regent Riswick. Here. Richard, Regent Richards is present. We have a quorum and we can proceed. We have, uh, is it, Josh, is it correct? We have, we have no uh, speakers? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So there, we have no speakers at public comment. Uh, moving on to the consent agenda, there are are there items that the members would like to remove from the consent agenda for a separate vote? A motion and a second are required to approve and receive items on the consent agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Regent Dunkel. Is there a second? Second. Regent Rouse. Regent Richards. Oh, we'll have a uh, we'll have a roll call vote. Regent Bates. Yes. Regent Dunkel. Yes. Regent Lindemeyer. Yes. Regent Barker. Yes. Regent Rouse. Yes. Regent Crow. Yes. Regent Butker. Yes. Regent Riswick. Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. Now, uh, the president occasionally has uh, takes a few minutes to make a comment uh, about uh, activities on campus. Uh, uh, later in the meeting, we'll have a presentation from the University of Iowa on the proposed budget increase for the new health care facility currently under construction in North Liberty. I recognize con concerns some may have about increasing the budget but the increases are not due to change in the plans or design of the hospital. Those remain the same from when the budget was initially presented to and passed by the board in 2021. What has changed and considerably are the costs and scarcity of materials and labor. <clears throat> These are challenges across the construction industry and not unique to this project. So while costs are higher, we must recognize the current economic environment and the role inflation is having on the price of goods and services. The University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics is a state leading medical provider and it delivers the highest level of tertiary and quaternary care that is not available elsewhere in the state. During the UIHC pre presentation, you will hear how often we must turn away patients from the hospital. It is very clear we need more capacity to care for thousands of Iowans who are turned away due to lack of available space. There are other factors at play as well. The North Liberty facility is the first step to create more capacity to improve our healthcare service to the people of Iowa. In its 10-year master plan, UIHC has discussed adding both a new inpatient tower and an ambulatory care center on the main campus. Both of these projects would will provide significant additional access to healthcare, 
but the North Liberty Hospital must happen first to open up these opportunities, to open up these opportunities. A delay or downsizing in this project will likely delay those other projects and thus delaying greater access to healthcare at UIHC for all Iowans. My recommendation will be to approve the increase in the budget for this critical project. And at this time, I'd like to recognize uh, each institution and we'll begin with uh, President Winterstein. Good, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. I appreciate the opportunity to provide an update and I certainly wanna provide my own welcome to Regent Ricewick. It's great to have you uh, on the board and we're grateful for your leadership and partnership uh, with uh, with the board and with Iowa State University. Thank you for taking on this important role. I have some slides, I believe, and are those visible or is that being handled by someone there? Perfect. Um, thank, you, thank you so much. Um, let's see, so we can go to the next slide. Um, we want to begin with a great photo uh, from the floor of Hilton Coliseum. Uh, no, it's not a photo of fans uh, rushing the uh, court after a big Cyclone basketball win. This is a packed house of students and employers attending one of our biannual career affairs. Every fall and spring, hundreds of companies converge in Hilton Coliseum and the nearby Sheeman Building. Our career fairs are open to all Iowa states and uh, students and alumni as well as any other job seeker. Iowa State is known for holding some of the largest career fairs in the nation, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences Career Day and the College of Engineering Indoor Career Fair are both ranked number one in the country. Next slide, please. Well, career fairs are just one of the ways we connect companies with career ready cyclones. And that's what I'm going to focus my remarks on today, how Iowa State supports business and industry across Iowa and beyond. More than 100,000 employees, excuse me, but that'd be a big number, more than 1,000 employers participate in one or more Iowa State career fairs, recruiting our students for internships, co-ops, and career positions. Internships are woven into nearly all of our academic programs, and are a requirement of many majors. Last year, for example, nearly 900 students in the College of Engineering reported participating in an internship or co-op. This is an excellent way to connect students, uh, helping them link uh, their classroom experience with professional practice. It really demonstrates our motto, science with practice. Another tool is SciHire, this is a university-wide database free of charge to employers to post their internships and job openings, set up campus interviews and register for our career fairs. Next slide, please. We're excited because more companies are establishing a physical presence in Ames in close proximity to our students. This past spring, Collins Aerospace opened an office directly across the street from Central Campus in Campus Town. This is a photo from the ribbon cutting celebration with members of our Iowa Space Grant Consortium and women in science and engineering teams. Collins Aerospace said having a location near Iowa State is about being able to work one-on-one -on -one and face-to-face -face with students throughout the school year. This allows them to build and maintain their talent pipeline that converts up to 70% of their student interns to full-time employees. It also allows our students to get the on-the-job experience without disrupting their academic progress. The company has been operating an office at the ISU Research Park since 2018, but took the opportunity to move even closer to campus this is one way we're expanding the geographic boundaries of the ISU Research Park to strengthen and customize our company partnerships. 
Next slide. The ISU Research Park is one of Iowa's most valuable economic assets. It's truly an engine for economic growth across the state, not just in Ames. Companies located at the park also have locations in 53 counties across the state, employing 2,500 Iowans. This is in addition to the 2,300 employees who work at the research park. They're good paying jobs with an average salary of $68,000. We also have about 300 student interns working at the research park at any given time. The park is a gateway to Iowa State's vibrant innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem. Since 2016, the ISU Startup Factory has helped 95 startups become viable, creating more than 220 new jobs. These companies have attracted more than $40 million in external investments. Next slide. Through Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, we're working hand in hand with industry leaders and professionals. Because we have ISU Extension specialists living and working in every county, we can provide localized expertise, customized support, and front door access to ISU in all 99 counties. A few highlights to share from the past year, Ag and Natural Resources uh, specialists made more than 160,000 contacts with farmers and agribusiness to improve their operations. One example, the farmers who completed our soil fertility short course reported increased profitability of at least $11 per acre. Human Sciences Extension provided training for more than 23,000 early child care professionals and more than 2,000 food service employees. And community and economic development specialists provided one-on-one -on -one business counseling and 54 business owners in underrepresented markets supporting minority-owned business. Next slide. Iowa State also serves as the statewide coordinator for the Iowa Small Business Development Centers. This is a great partnership with the Ivy College of Business, Extension and Outreach, and our fellow region institutions and 11 Iowa community colleges. SBDC worked with nearly 4,000 entrepreneurs and business owners in every county last year. The results are impressive. More than $99 million in capital infusion, uh, $343.8 million in increased sales, 208 new businesses were started, and more than 1,800 jobs were created across the state. Next slide. Iowa State also has a Center for Industrial Research and Service. Cirrus works with business and industry in all 99 counties to enhance their business performance, providing research-based, customized services in five main areas, growth, productivity, technology, leadership, and workforce. You can see their statewide impact posted here on our website. Over the past five years, Cirrus and its partners have helped fuel extraordinary business growth. They've worked with nearly 4,200 clients, resulting in more than $3 billion in impact. This includes sales gained or retained, new investments and avoided costs, and more than 31,000 jobs have been created or retained. The statewide map is also an interactive tool. You can click each county to see Cirrus's county-specific impact. Next slide. Iowa State's economic development efforts are closely tied to our research, and our research enterprise is flourishing. We just announced a new record for external funding of $601.7 million. This includes a record of $284.2 million in sponsored research led by major investments from federal agencies. We also receive record support from non-federal sources, including business and industry. Our research provides extraordinary value to them through new market innovations, value-added technologies, and technical expertise, among other benefits. You'll recall hearing about our five-year $16 million grant to expand rural broadband. 
In April, Dr. Hong Wei Zhang talked to the board about this initiative. We're excited to see the project moving forward. Wireless infrastructure will be installed at 12 locations in State Center, McCallsburg, Nevada, Ames, Gilbert, and Boone. The goal is to create what Dr. Zhang refers to as the broadband prairie, that is to develop and test new affordable technology to meet the needs of 39% of rural Americans who don't have internet access. Next slide. We're always looking for innovative ways to partner with business and industry. A new collaboration between faculty in our English department and John Deere is an exciting example. John Deere is part of the state's high school registered apprenticeship program, giving high school students the opportunity to learn a skilled trade. The company also believes in the importance of having well-rounded employees to be good communicators in the workplace. That's where our English faculty come into play. Deere asked them to consider a curriculum that would help their welding apprentices improve their communication skills. They developed a four week course covering a number of topics, interpersonal communication, presentation skills, PowerPoint, slide design, and components of a successful elevator pitch. The course culminates with the students using these new skills to give formal presentations to dear stakeholders about their apprenticeship experience. They also use their skills to promote the program to their high school classmates. The partnership started last year at Deere's Davenport plant and expanded this summer to include the company's Waterloo location. Next slide. Finally, I want to recognize the many connections that our faculty and staff have with different boards, councils, and community committees uh, in Iowa. You see a few highlighted on this slide. We have representatives on the Iowa Business Council's Business Education Alliance, the Iowa Innovation Council, and America's Cultivation Corridor, which is headquartered at the ISU Research Park. And we also play key roles in organizations that support Iowa's agricultural industry. We have longstanding representation on commodity boards, grower associations, and of course, the State Fair Board. Well, there are many stories that I can share about our support for business and industry. Iowa State University is proud to be at the forefront of research, innovation, education, and engagement that is accelerating the state's economic progress. It's our land grant mission in action. That concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions from the board. Regent Parker. Uh, President Winterstein, uh, could you tell us about any trends that you see in extension? Uh, for example, you know, is that number of contacts increasing? Uh, are more of them online? And are the topics uh, that they're addressing changing? Well, certainly, I think that as with our curriculum on campus, extensions curriculum evolves with the uh, topics of the day as well. Uh, and we also see it in 4-H, as 4-H is in different communities with new audiences, certainly maintaining a strong presence with agriculture, but gaining more urban uh, students engaged in that great youth program. Um, as we think about topics that are out there, we see our uh, families and communities uh, specialists engaged in critical issues like mental health, in addition to the workforce issues of helping train the child care providers of Iowa. So, so I would say yes the, to your question that it is a constant evolution of how we respond to the needs of local communities and individuals who participate in Extension's important programs. And you're seeing number of contacts increase and, and is the online versus in-person changing? So I couldn't give you numbers on contacts, Regent Barker, just off the top of my head, but, but I would say that I think they're at least they're pretty steady. The um, uh, online development certainly was uh, something that occurred in a greater way because of COVID. Again, just like it occurred with our classrooms on campus, 
So you see more online, more virtual conferences occurring than we would have had pre-COVID, very definitely. Thank you. Regent Ryerswick. Thanks for the presentation. That was very informative. I like the uh, <clears throat> the John Deere Apprenticeship Program too. That's quite intriguing. I'm curious, how many high schoolers are involved in that program and what part of the state are they from and, and how big do you think that can be? So again, we, it was at the Davenport plant originally and then expanded to the Waterloo plant uh, this summer. Um, actual numbers of the apprentice uh, individuals that were involved, I couldn't give you, but I could get you that information. Uh, so that would be available for you. Uh, for me, when I heard this story, uh, what impressed me was to see a young man uh, who we were told really had difficulty in communicating even with his colleagues. And by the end of the session uh, provided by our English faculty, he was able to stand up and have a conversation with the president of the company. So, but we could certainly get you the number of students that participated, Regent Ricewick. I'd, I'd appreciate that. I think there's potential for other employers in the state too. There's a big need mm -hmm. for this sort of thing. Yep. Uh, does John Deere ultimately hire these kids that go through the program or, or what happens? They certainly want to. That, that yeah. is the goal in those apprenticeship programs. And, and, and I'm sure that John Deere would be happy to give us what they see as their completion rate or hiring rate uh, out of the apprenticeship programs they do in their welding program. It'd be pretty cool to see how long they stick and you know what's the turnover and that sort of thing. Anyway, that, that's all yeah. I have. Great, thank you for your interest in that. We'll get you those numbers. Well, thank you everyone. Always a pleasure to be with the board. Thank you, President Wenderson. Uh, at this time, I'd uh, like to recognize Interim Superintendent Cool from the special schools. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Can't tell you how excited I am to, to be back with the special schools. Maybe just a second here to make sure I can. Okay. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying that uh, Iowa School for the Deaf and Iowa Educational Services with blind and visually impaired, and we hear a lot of different terms being thrown out there, uh, but those are the two that I'm going to uh, try to stick with today. Uh, but we have officially uh, earned a five-year accreditation status. Uh, we had Cognia uh, Global Commission come in and do an accreditation visit. Cognia is a not-for-profit uh, private accrediting organization we use to provide measurable, meaningful evaluation and feedback help our schools discover and maintain strengths. Cognius also identifies and implements a process to improve uh, the weaker areas. Uh, the designation was active as of June 17th. Like other schools, uh, universities and everybody goes through the accreditation process. We go through it every five years and really uh, former superintendent Gattle deserves uh, some recognition in this, uh, some credit for working with Cognia to make this possible. We went through an accreditation process uh, that is kind of unprecedented. Both of the IESB, the I, and ISD both uh, went through this process together. It's the first time we did that. And Superintendent Gettle walked uh, us through that process. Of course, I wasn't here at that time. Uh, that was this last school year when I had retired the first time. Um, so it's really good to be back with all of you. But he did an outstanding job. The accreditation process begins approximately a year before talking to accreditation teams do their site visit. I use site visit uh, in quotes because uh, it was done via Zoom this year. Cognia conducts intensive interviews and discussions. They review stakeholder surveys. Uh, they look at our self-study document to ensure that we're doing, we're providing and implementing an education for blind and visually impaired, deaf and hard of hearing students with the utmost integrity. In other words, they're validating that schools do what they say they do. So we do a self study for a year saying, looking at our programs and telling them what we do and what we do well. And uh, we identify areas of 
weakness for ourselves and uh, point those out as well. And then that team reviews everything, does great interviews and uh, conducts their accreditation. This year, the site visit was conducted via Zoom. And the evaluator of the team, the head person for the team, was impressed with how, told us the team was impressed with how we keep our focus on our students. The Cognia team told us uh, some of our strengths were stakeholders commented on how we have a clearly defined mission, our programs and our student focused, inclusive and supportive, and that ISE and IESPDI are resources uh, that have a positive impact on families statewide. Uh, they let us know that areas to explore include uh, clarifying the role of IES EDI and ISD statewide to increase stakeholder understanding and ownership, as well as continuing to expand conversations with school districts, ADAs, area education agencies, and the Department of Education to ensure mutual understanding and benefits of programming and services. Next slide, please. So after a two-year sabbatical, if you will, due to COVID-19, ISD campers were back on campus this year. Uh, we had 78 campers registered for two different camps that were held here. Uh, one of our campers, for example, who does not attend, most of our campers were not uh, ISD students. One of the campers uh, said that she was really sad when uh, we didn't have the, camp, the camps on campus because she missed the friends that she would that she had made here at the school in previous camps that she attended. And so she was really excited that uh, the camp was back. She now is a senior in high school and she says she uh, likes to be around other students who have hearing loss. And she encouraged all of her camp buddies to attend this year because she knew that if they didn't come, they'd miss out on an excellent opportunity. It was really nice uh, to hear that feedback from her. Uh, 78 of the students were uh, that registered from three three different states. Uh, South Dakota sent a couple of students this year, Nebraska, of course, and Iowa. So more than half our students don't attend, didn't attend ISD, uh, but they come in for a language immersive uh, opportunity uh, that they don't really get a chance to experience in their local schools, where many of them are the only deaf or hard of hearing student out there. Likewise, for our blind and visually impaired that I'll talk about here next. But uh, so if we could go to the next slide. On the uh, blind side, we had 118 students attend. Uh, and it's, it's important to note that um, 97 of those, it's important for us that 97 of those are unduplicated campers. So these are camps that we provide we had 11 camps this summer throughout the state, including Cedar Falls, Council Bluffs, Des Moines, Fairfield, Dubuque, Mount Pleasant, and Sioux Center. Uh, six were day camps. Themes included things such as sports and recreation, developing social skills and making friends. And all of this uh, prepares them for life as an independent contributing adult. The camps address components of the expanded core curriculum. Camps are age-based with students as young as kindergarten attending some of them. And uh, you know my experience with blind and visually impaired, deaf and hard of hearing kids, uh, probably like it is for any child, but the younger they are, the, I don't know, the cuter they are when it comes to watching them explore their environments and learn new things. But there were a total of 118 campers for 2022. And as I said, 97 of them were unduplicated. A feature that began during the 2020 uh, school year, uh, summer, uh, because of COVID, which we couldn't have in-person camps, um, it proved to be, the, what we did proved to be more popular than ever this summer. And it's partners and play packs. So we had these packs that we sent out and they were requested by 60 families. And uh, in 2020, the kits, that was the initial kickoff with these kits, and I'll explain those, uh, they were sent to 33 families. In 2021, just 12 families requested these book themed reading and tactile activities. The kids provided an opportunity for IES BVI families to participate in an activity outside of the classroom and out different than the in-home services that IES BVI provides. Families love being able to have the opportunity to be involved in this way. Uh, they attribute 
the growth, we attribute this growth in uh, families' uh, text messaging to notify parents about the home-based kits. Because of that, within an hour this year of that text message, we had 31 families, whereas before it was just 12 the year before, we had 31 families requesting the kits. And by the end of the next day, we had 50 families that had reached out to us requesting these kits. And I just uh, want to make a comment about you know, technology. This is an example of when technology works, it really is great. And these kits are especially useful to students who are too young for camp or students whose health conditions prevent them from attending. Uh, book themes included going on a bear hunt, uh, whoops, I skipped it, and uh, Oscar and Claus, Mission to Catania, Chicka Chicka Boom Boom, and things like that. And so um, our opportunities are for these little folks. Uh, it's, it's nice to put a smile on their faces. And the boxes are individualized based on the child's development and sensory needs. Uh, needed adaptations are included in the kits along with supplies, detailed instructions, and additional resources. And the materials are brightly colored, scented, textured, or include the sound and sound sources to spark use of multiple senses. And for me, um, just kind of a personal thing is, um, I worked for, I've worked for 43 years in the field of deafness, but blindness was something new to me in 2012 when uh, Patrick Clancy took over as our superintendent. And um, through that process, I became the assistant administrator for both the schools. And um, I didn't have the background with blind visually impaired students. And so last week was the Association for the Education and Rehabilitation of Blind and Visually Impaired in St. Louis. And I asked my regional directors if they thought it would be beneficial for me to attend that conference. And uh, they said, yes. So I went down and, and it really was. It was an opportunity for me to see the parallels between blind visually impaired services and deaf and hard of hearing services. Um, but an opportunity for me to learn a lot more about just how far our TBIs and O&Ms and staff go to provide these opportunities for these children. I got to see uh, young blind children being introduced to their environment. Um, and it really, I, I didn't, I don't get that opportunity very much here in Iowa. And I certainly haven't prior to this year to actually see these, these folks, parents support parents or be involved with the students in ways that, you know, these blind children just to see the smiles and the laughing and uh, participating in horseback riding or just sitting down in the sand like this slide shows and just exploring that. It's, it's new stuff to them, and uh, it really takes a lot of dedication and intentional teaching in order to uh, help these students to um, grow up knowing what their environment, quote unquote, looks like. So um, it really was a great opportunity, and I appreciate the opportunity to do that. Next slide, please. Uh, just a quick update on Long Hall, our high school building here. Um, you know, we received the funding, $4.325 million. Uh, again, we are so grateful to be able to do that. Um, you can see the new windows that were put in. Um, you can see, if you see the white in the tuck pointing, um, they just are completing all of the tuck pointing outside and it gives it that uh, real, um, I don't know, it, it's kind of a, it, it's, it looks good. The Acid wash and everything will take that away, but right now the, the tuck pointing makes it look like an antique building and it, makes, it really looks good. But the building is coming right along. Um, ISD and uh, we, we ended up putting an, an additional $612,000 beyond the 4.325. Um, and I wanna point out that 500,000 of that came from the sale of the land, if you remember across Highway 92 here in Council Bluffs, just across. Um, we, we sold that farmland to Methodist and we used 500, that 500,000 to help. Uh, and what we did with that is we finished the building. We painted and replaced carpet in all of the rooms and we purchased new window coverings throughout. Um, it wouldn't have been as nice to have all these new windows if we didn't have updated window coverings. And the teachers and staff did a really remarkable job adjusting to the temporary classrooms, uh, which they are now exiting to move back to Long Hall. We have the movers in doing that. Uh, highlights from that project, of course, included the new HVAC system, 
Um, I wasn't here for most of the year as they were doing the renovation, but when I came back, I walked through the building and it was an immediate uh, refreshment, refreshing experience because the HVAC system was installed and the windows were in. And I've been here for 32 years to walk in and feel the difference in that building was incredible. And uh, the new windows, of course, look good. We have a digital audio visual alert system that has scrolling messages that can go across the screen so that uh, deaf and hard of hearing have, uh, can access it and as well as it's visual. So the, our, it's visual for the deaf and it's audio for the blind and visually impaired. I apologize, I misspoke. Otherwise, uh, if there's not an emergency, it just displays the time and is a part of the system now that uh, lets students know it's time to move on to the next class. Uh, we have a technology wall in every classroom, which holds the visual audio, audio visual alert system. It has the smart board and a whiteboard, and it has the room's control temperatures all on that wall. There's technology uh, in the natural light entering the room. So the technology now allows the light, the room to lighten or dim according to the outside light that's coming in. Um, we're just really excited uh, to move back into the building. Our movers were here uh, Monday and Tuesday and started moving teachers' belongings back to their classrooms in the high school. Um, we're restoring the uh, LMC so that we can once again have meeting rooms and uh, a wellness room and a weight room for the students to participate in, getting our uh, racquetball courts back to where we can play volleyball. Um, so it's really nice to be moving back into that building. Next slide, please. I want to talk just about this, this student, but um, also the opportunity that we have, you know, two IAS BVI students advanced from regional competition to national finals. And, uh, you know, you can read through that, that slide there, so I won't just read it to you, but Iowa can claim a new national champion. And it's this young man here, Nathan Deeds. He's a junior from Williamsburg High School, and he won first place varsity division at the National Grill Challenge competition that's held in Los Angeles in late June. IESB EBI staff worked with students preparing them for the spring regional competition hosted by the Iowa Department of the Blind and the top 50 scorers from all the regional events then advanced to nationals. There are five competition categories. Ten top scorers in each category advanced to the nationals. There were 800 competitors at the regional level. Iowa had two students that earned the trip to nationals. The other finalist was a, a student by the name of Contran, a third grader from Fairfield. Well, due to COVID, Nathan had earned the status of finalist both in 2020 and 2021, but without an in-person competition those years, no further competition was held. So Nathan then, his specialty is work in charts and graphs. In addition to the highest national award for his varsity competition, he also earned all around first place in charts and graphs in Los Angeles. And the Braille Challenge is the only academic competition of its kind in North America, and the goal is to motivate students to hone and practice their Braille literacy skills, such as reading comprehension, spelling, speed and accuracy, proofreading, and for Nathan, charts and graphs. Next slide, please. So just a shout out to Nathan. I mean, what a, what a tremendous uh, student and, and uh, what a great accomplishment. Um, ISD's Immersion Conference for the seventh year ISD hosted an immersion conference for educational interpreters, uh, interpreters in K-12 settings, providing interpreting services for students. We had 63 registrations, uh, which over half of the educational interpreters in the educational setting attended this this workshop. It gives us an opportunity to provide interpreters statewide who work with deaf and hard of hearing children who obviously don't come to our campus. So we go out and work with these interpreters to provide professional development uh, because, uh, well, it used to be that we had interpreter training programs here in the state, but currently we only have one and that's in Scott County. And then once an interpreter graduates, 
the national organization that does professional development for interpreters doesn't focus on these interpreters skills. And so ISD has taken on uh, the lead with that. The American Sign Language Immersion Experience provides interpreters the opportunity to practice and use only ASL throughout the entire conference. This is especially helpful for interpreters who do not have other ASL fluent adults with whom to converse through the year. Because if you're going to use a language, you have to be exposed to the language and use the language. And uh, for those interpreters out in those rural settings in Iowa, they don't have that opportunity. So many interpreters only use ASL for interpreting and not conversationally. So we provide them with that experience. The nat national presenters provided insight on the topic of language deprivation. And language deprivation is, deprivation is when that child, uh, they're at the critical age for language acquisition, which is up to about the first five years. You, you know, you think about your children or your grandchildren or whatever you have, the children who enter kindergarten who are hearing have parents and grandparents and siblings and friends and uh, people at the grocery, anywhere they go, they have uh, access to a lot of language around them. So they come into school with a great deal of language. And then we teach them the rules of English as they're going through school. And for our deaf and hard of hearing children, they don't have access to all that incidental learning. Um, and so language deprivation is a huge issue with deaf and hard of hearing children. And so we provided professional development for these interpreters statewide on language deprivation and how it could impact long-term neurological development. And interpreters at the conference learned academic and social emotional effects of language deprivation and how to better work with these students. CEUs were offered for the interpreters and this year, uh, the immersion conference was open to teachers of the deaf throughout the state as well. Uh, and the event is funded I want to make sure I, I let you folks know that we received Part B funding through the Department of Education. And so in collaboration with the Department of Education, by using this Part B money, we're able to host this immersion conference. Next slide, please. And then there's the IES VDI Summer Institute, which is going to take place on Monday and Tuesday of next week. August 1st and 2nd, and we do this Summer Institute annually on the IES BDI side, and school staff wondering how to best provide for a student who is blind or visually impaired, gain reassurance, confidence, and practical skills during the annual Summer Institute. So this, is, this Summer Institute is hosted by IES BDI, but our focus is uh, helping educators who aren't trained that our TVIs and O&Ms go in and support uh, just to give them, uh, it, it's kind of like that um, education for dummies, you know, that I need to take personally. Uh, you see all those books out there. I'm not calling anybody a dummy. You see those books out there that I'm the guy that um, is learning a lot about blind and visually impaired. And so the Summer Institute is exactly what somebody like me needs to attend. Uh, in August, nearly 120 general and special education teachers and paraeducators will benefit from this event. It's going to be held in Ankeny, and IES BBI staff and outside presenters provide nearly three dozen educational sessions covering topics such as literacy, STEM, assistive technology, transition, additional disabilities, and other sessions to help teachers be more effective with students who have visual impairments. Last year, one of the participants noted it was helpful to her to meet adults who were living with being blind. Other participants appreciate the opportunity to explore technology and devices which can be used in classrooms, such as a talking tape measure. And that concludes uh, my update for you folks, and I'd certainly be open to any questions you might have. Are there any questions for Superintendent Cool? Thank you. We appreciate that your report. We also appreciate the fact that you were able to step in, uh, and uh, doesn't sound like my, does sound like we haven't missed a beat. So appreciate that very much. Thank you. Uh, because of the change in venue, we sort of changed the sequence here. But uh, I'm going to now, President Nook, if you're uh, ready uh, to do your 
presentation and we'll follow it up with uh, President Wilson. Is that okay. okay? Are you ready, President Nook? Okay. I am, if the slides are. Thanks, Richard, President Richards, uh, members of the board. And uh, on behalf of the students, faculty, and staff of uh, the University of Northern Iowa, I'd like to extend a, a warm welcome to Regent Rise, Risewick. And we look forward to welcome you, you and the other regents to our campus here in a little over a month as we host the, the next regent meeting. Today, as the board uh, considers tuition rates for the coming year, I'll focus my remarks primarily on what you and I has done and will continue to do to make uh, education affordable at the University of Northern Iowa and also to make it accessible. Next slide, please. Before I launch into that, I do want to take a moment and introduce uh, Pete Morris, uh, who just joined us July 1 as our Director of University Relations. Uh, for the last seven years, uh, Pete has been working as the Associate Athletic Director for Strategic Communication at Virginia Tech University. Uh, before that, he worked with uh, the University of Oklahoma uh, in public relations and media and helped launch and unveil the $370 million renovation project for Oklahoma Memorial Stadium. Early in his career, he was the Associate Director of Public Relations for the Kansas City Chiefs where he coordinated public relations and event management for four Super Bowls. Uh, he also has worked with uh, the NCAA on Final Four and college football playoff championship games, as well as multiple collegiate local games. Pete is uh, originally from Southwest uh, Wisconsin and completed his baccalaureate degree at Loris College and is also a graduate of the Disney Customer Service Training Program. It's really a pleasure to welcome uh, Pete to our campus and have him directing our university relations work. Welcome, Pete. Uh, next slide, please. So I said I want to talk a little bit about what the University of Northern Iowa has done to help our students manage the costs of an education at the University of Northern Iowa. In this particular slide, we take a 10-year look at the relative amount of uh, support that has been offered to students uh, who are in need of aid at the University of Northern Iowa. What you can see is that the purple bars uh, represent the amount of aid that comes in the form of loans, the gold bar, the amount of aid that comes in the form of grants and scholarships, and the aqua teal colored uh, bar in the form of student employment. This shows both the dollars in each of those, but more importantly, the percentage of the funds that students are receiving in these different buckets of, of uh, support. What uh, caught my attention as we first looked at this is the way that the not only the amount, but the percentage of funding that students receive that comes from loans over the 10, last 10 years has decreased precipitably on our campus. And all of that has been made up by the increase in scholarships and grants. Uh, so we have really been able to help those students who most need help financially to achieve an education at the University of Northern Iowa move away from loans. We have decreased both the number of students and percentage of students who take out loans, but also the average loan that those students are taking out. By being able to make available additional grants um, and scholarship support to those students. This is a real compliment um, and a big thank you to our foundation for the work that they've done to raise scholarships um, and some growing support through the federal government uh, as well. Um, so uh, it really is a, 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 an emphasis here on our campus to move students away from loans as much as possible so that their extended cost of their education is decreased as they have less and less interest to pay on those loans. Next slide, please. Over the years, we have mentioned a little bit about what has happened with the student debt, but just as a, a way of an update uh, for the way that you and I has uh, attacked student debt on our campus, this particular uh, slide shows in gold, uh, in gold the Iowa average student debt at the time of graduation. This includes private schools, or private four-year institutions and public four-year institutions. The purple bars show you and I's average student debt at the time of, of graduation. Um, and what you see is that for the most part, we run about $5,000 below uh, the Iowa average. We are also $5,000 below the national average. 
while this uh, graph shows a rather steady um, uh, uh, average student loan debt for our students, the real story started back in 2000 and two th 2009 and 2010. At that time, our average student loan debt was really equal to that of the state of Iowa average, as well as the national average. And the university implemented uh, the program Live Like a Student, uh, full name being Live Like a Student Today So You Don't Have To Tomorrow. Um, and part of that program is a basic financial literacy course that helps students understand how to put together a budget, uh, what their expenses are, what their revenue is, and how to manage gaps between those two. One of the other important pieces of that program, though, is private loan counseling. Um, and any student who qualifies for a private loan on our campus uh, is required to meet for a half an hour with one of our loan counselors to go through their budget to look at what the real gap between their revenue and their expenses is, and to be able to, to really think critically about how much loan they need to take out. Do they take, need to take out all that they've qualified for, or could they take out a smaller amount? Are there ways to increase their revenues or decrease their expenses so that the gap that they're hoping to cover with the loan can actually be less? And what we have seen over the really now 12 years that that program has been in place is that we've lowered the average loan debt by about $5,000 relative to the national average. But we've also lowered the percentage of our students who take out those loans from over right around 80% to now around 65, 66%. It really is a success story in the way that we've helped manage, as I said before, the long-term cost of an education at a region institution by reducing the amount of interest that they're paying over the lifetime, over their lifetime for their education. Uh, next slide, please. I want to introduce you to two prospective students. Actually, they're enrolled already for this fall, but uh, they will be freshmen, Nathan Anderson and Caleb Borwig. Both of these students uh, were um, participants in UNI Center for Urban Education uh, program that is funded through a federal TRIO grant. And that is our Educational Opportunity Center here at the University of Northern Iowa. Nathan and Caleb were each awarded $4,000 scholarships to help cover their cost of tuition and other expenses, and they've chosen to use those scholarships here at the University of Northern Iowa. Those scholarships may be renewed annually, uh, provided eligibility requirements are met, and the scholarships are funded by the Academic Attainment Fund, which was established with the generous grant from CUNA Mutual Foundation. It's a great partnership. Uh, a little bit about Nathan. Nathan was born in South Carolina, but he grew up here in, in Waterloo. Uh, he just graduated from Waterloo West High School and um, wants to major in interactive digital studies program here at the University of Northern Iowa. And he aspires to be a documentary filmmaker uh, when he completes that degree. Nathan uh, was one of, participated both in the Educational Talent Search Program here and also served as the Education Talent Search Student Ambassador while he was here. And he made the following comment, the Talent Search Program was incredibly influential for me. We got to do so many things like college visits, financial literacy courses, and we even got to take a trip to the College Expo in Chicago, where I was able to talk with several historically black colleges and universities, which I really enjoyed. I even got some acceptances on the spot. And I was just like, wow. The opportunities that the Education Talent Search Program provides to students, uh, especially those who uh, may not be thinking about college is really a way to open their experiences and provide them with a way to see that there is a path for them to a higher education. Anderson said that he's really eager to get involved in uh, things here on our campus and is looking forward to joining the Black Student Union, also eager to join one of our fraternities on campus. And he said that he's really looking forward to the freedom that comes with leaving the nest and venturing on, out on his own, none of which would have been possible without the scholarship from UNIQ and his experiences within educational talent search. Caleb Borwig um, was also involved in this program, but he has been uh, very engaged in TRIO's Upward Bound program, again, a federally funded program to help students um, from underrepresented um, uh, backgrounds understand what it takes to be a college student and what the opportunities are uh, at colleges and universities, especially within our state. 
Caleb as well is a graduate of West High School here in, in Waterloo. And as I said, has been very involved uh, with the college, the Upward Bound program here. And he says um, uh, he was also involved in his school's robotics program. And he says that those two are the things that he dedicated all of his time to and he felt that put the most amount of work into while he was a high school student. And he says it was it really helped him keep on track, helped him keep his GPA up. He got to meet, meet new people and really learned how to work as part of a team. Interestingly, as he worked on the robotics team, he wasn't one of the robotic designers. His role was in marketing and communication for the team and marketing the team. And it's where he really developed his interest in graphic design and graphic design technology, which he will study at the University of, of Northern Iowa beginning this fall. And what he said is one of the biggest things that Upward Bound does is this summer program where they have students, freshmen to juniors, come in from high schools and spend the entire summer staying in the dorms on UNI's campus and take high school classes. Then when you're a senior, you take two actual college courses. So it's just a really great opportunity to earn high school and college credit, but also familiarize myself with the UNI campus and get a tiny taste of what it might be like to attend college there. Borwig is a student that this uh, scholarship means a great deal to. Um, he doesn't have anyone that is going to be able to help him with, financially with his education. He really is on his own to pay for his own education. So this particular scholarship has been uh, uh, really tremendous uh, to him in being able to support his ability to get a college education anywhere. And he's chosen the University of Northern Iowa to do that. Um, one of the things that he said about this Upward Bound program, I feel that without Upward Bound, there's a chance that I wouldn't even be trying for college at all. Upward Bound has completely shaped how I think in terms of my education. And even with the scholarship I received, I would never have found that opportunity on my own. I would never have sought it out. So basically, Upward Bound and the UNI Center for uh, Urban Education really are the big reasons why I'm going to college. And with all the scholarship help, that's why I'm able to go to college at all. So uh, congratulations to both of these students for on their scholarships, and we look forward to welcoming, welcoming them this fall to the University of Northern Iowa. Next slide, please. Oh, one more slide, please, before thank you. I think there's one more. After the thank you. Okay, we can go to the thank you and I'll speak off of that. Um, there was uh, the other thing that I want to take a moment to mention is that yesterday the University of Northern Iowa launched the University uh, UNI at Iowa Community Colleges. This is a program that dis that extends what we did uh, with UNI at DMAC uh, to four, three additional community colleges: Western Iowa Tech, Iowa Western Community College, and Indian Hills Community College. This program is all about removing barriers to high demand careers. What we know is that there are many students that are place bound throughout uh, the state of Iowa who have completed an associate degree, whether it's an associate of arts, an associate of science, uh, or an associate of arts of applied sciences. They face uh, many barriers in that many of them are a little bit older than average and have started their careers. They work full time, they've started families. Relocating to one of the regent institutions is just not possible for many of them. So how can we put an affordable public education in reach of these students? They also um, face a barrier oftentimes of price. Um, they have found out and figured out how to be successful and how to afford and pay for the community college education. But moving to one of the region institutions and the increase in cost is a barrier to many of them as well. One of the other barriers that these students face with online programs, which is at the heart of UNI at Iowa Community Colleges, is simply support. Throughout uh, the pandemic, many of us have realized that taking things online is possible, but it does create some real barriers and some challenges for students. And that personal contact is one of them. Through UNI at Iowa Community Colleges, we're hoping to address those three barriers of location, cost, and support. By reaching out with our online programs and making these available to any student in the state that has completed an Associate of Arts degree or an Associate of Science degree or an Associate of Applied Science at an Iowa Community College, we're able to provide an education, a high quality region education 
to any student across the Iowa in their in the state of Iowa in their home community. In addition, the governor has allocated $4.166 million of uh, federal um, uh, aid for us to be able to scholarship some of these students that have financial need. These American Rescue Plan funds will be used for scholarships um, for those students that qualify, that meet the, the financial need to help offset the cost uh, between our tuition and that of a community college. In addition to that, we're placing a student success uh, specialist at each of these four institutions, DMAC, Western Iowa Tech, uh, Iowa Western Community College and Indian Hills, <clears throat> to provide a personalized support to all of the students that are involved in these programs. It is an effort to bring the high touch personalized education that is the hallmark of a UNI education to our online programs in these communities with the goal of eventually spreading this to other community colleges around the state. At the moment, the, the students can earn degrees in uh, a Bachelor's of Liberal Studies program, criminal justice um, in applied science, an elementary education, uh, Bachelor of Arts degree, a Bachelor of Arts in management, business administration, and a Bachelor of Arts in managing businesses and organizations and there's a new program just approved by the regents uh, at the last meeting in individual studies, human services, a, a new Bachelor of Arts program. And these will continue, to, new programs will continue to grow here at the University of Northern Iowa. So thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about how we're addressing not only access through programs like you and I at Iowa Community Colleges, but also help control the costs for our students through you and I, Iowa Community Colleges, but also the work we've done with Live Like a Student and other similar programs and the support we use from the federal government to help students access education and have that education funded. Thank you, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Are, are there any questions for President Nook, Regent Bates? Thank you, President Nook, that was very, very interesting. Um, I think you're launching the new launch that you have is extremely interesting to all of us. I just the only question I have is, do you have a number of prospective students that you think will start? And do you have an upper limit? Or is this uh, unknown? Yeah, uh, what we have, uh, we don't have an upper limit at the moment. What we do know is that uh, financially we can handle um, uh, at least a hundred this year, this fall and spring of new students that qualify for the financial aid portion of this. Um, and, uh, you know, we're expecting that we'll have a, a rather small start here this fall, but we already have twice as many students in the UNI at DMAC program as we planned for this time at this time. And uh, we have great uh, enthusiasm from the other three partner schools in particular. But as I mentioned, these scholarships are available to anyone in the state that meets the financial criteria and has a two-year degree, an associate's degree from any Iowa community college. They don't need to be associated with just these four institutions. Um, the four institutions will have a support person with them. Well, coming from the rural area, I have to tell you through the years, I've known a lot of people who would have liked to have furthered their education and could not because they have a family or they farm where they farm, et cetera. So I think it's really a good program. Thank you. Thank you. These new three new, the three new institutions were chosen because they are the furthest from the region institutions and face the greatest challenge in accessing public education in the state. Are there any further questions? Regent sure. Barker? Um, President Duck, just looking at that first graph that you showed, it looks like student employment is declining, but I think that's probably as a result of changing enrollment. But it, it, sometime it might be interesting if you have that broken down per student. Yeah, there's a couple of things that have happened there. Some of it is a, a, a some decline in enrollment, but another piece of it is that we have seen that um, fewer and fewer of our students are choosing to work on campus. And part of that is the increase in um, uh, wages that we've seen um, uh, as the economy has heated up and we need to make sure we're able to adjust our salaries here on campus uh, to take care of that. 
The other thing that we saw is uh, during, especially during COVID, um, there was a, a sort of a, a pullback. People um, did not engage in uh, the work opportunities on campus. We had less need for them. And so there has been a bit of a culture shift that we're hoping to pull back because it is important. The students that we know that work on our campus are more likely to be successful. Uh, when they start working 20 or more hours off campus in particular, it does impact uh, what they do in the classroom and their completion rates. So anything we can do to keep them working on campus, uh, these work study dollars are essential for that. And thanks. So just be clear, these are just this is just on campus student employment does not include off campus student. It employment. does not include off campus. Yeah, it's the federal work study program dollars only. Right. Yeah. Got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, President Nook. Uh, thank you. So no, no further questions. Uh, thank you, President Nook. Uh, at this time, uh, President Wilson. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, President Richards and members of the Board of Regents for allowing me the opportunity to give you just a few brief updates concerning the University of Iowa. Before I start, I want to join my colleagues in welcoming our newest Regent, Regent White uh, Ricewick. We're so excited that you've become a member of the Board, and we're eager to learn more about you and to share more about the University of Iowa, and I know you're coming in about a month to visit campus, so uh we're excited about that so welcome i thought i would uh really focus today next slide on our strategic plan and you're going to see uh next slide please you're going to see this wheel of our priorities over and over again if you'll bear with us because you helped uh, approve our our strategic plan and we're we're making sure that this is a living breathing document and that we're focused at, on it at all times this is our wheel of priorities five priorities and today I'm going to just focus on the fifth one, transformative societal impact, and give you a flavor of the kinds of things that we're really proud of over the last year, just a, a, a smattering of, of the opportunities and activities we're involved in to, to give you a sense of how widespread they are and how hopefully impactful they are. Today I'm going to focus on our healthcare impact, on our impact in communities across the state, and then finally our impact on K through 12. So next slide. The transformative societal impacts priority is quite uh, bold, I would say, and you've read the document. We want to expand the university's impact on local and regional communities, the state of Iowa, and indeed the world by le leveraging our areas of distinction. And uh, this is a it's a big statement, but we're committed to it across the university and across our various units and departments. Again, today I'll focus just on a couple of examples to illustrate healthcare, our work in communities, and then our K through 12 educational activities. Next slide. One of the things that we talk about a lot at the University of Iowa, and it's partly because we hear about it from so many of our constituencies, is the shortage of nursing and nurses across the state of Iowa and really across the Midwest. And so we've been pulling together resources, pulling together our teams, and I wanna give a lot of credit to our College of Nursing for their rather, I would say, industrious activities across the state. The, one of the examples of that is that we now have three plus one agreements in nine community, with nine community colleges across the state of Iowa. These are uh, really important agreements that allow students to move from an RN to a BSN, but they are they can stay in their communities and do this locally. So they continue to work uh, as RNs and then obtain that BSN degree online in their final year through the University of Iowa. This is a, a really, I think, important aspect of what we do and how we extend our reach. We're excited to continue to grow these partnerships we had 121 students enrolled last spring in these kinds of three plus one agreements. And we also have articulation agreements with 15, with all 15 community colleges across Iowa. So we'll continue to work on these activities and, and work toward trying to increase our nursing workforce in the state of Iowa and beyond. Next slide. Another important aspect of our healthcare outreach is coming also from the College of Nursing. We've mounted new simulation in motion 
uh, program, Sim Iowa, if you will. And you may have read or heard about this. It's gotten a lot of media attention in the last couple of weeks. We now have a really exciting opportunity to help get out in the community and help train healthcare workers in a variety of healthcare activities. This is, um, we have three vehicles now, three trucks that are based in Iowa City, in Des Moines and in Sioux City. These are gonna be simulation training operations on the move. And they're gonna move around the state of Iowa and help train local healthcare providers. This was funded by an $8 million grant from the Helmsley Charitable Trust. And we are one of only four states in the country with this capability. So these are an important aspect of our outreach. Uh, you can see that we're busy training people across the state. We've um, One of the innovative things we've done with this is we've actually uh, put one of these simulation trucks out ahead of the RAGBRAI uh, route this year. So last week, the truck went across and followed the RAGBRAI, RAGBRAI uh, route and trained all of the people in the communities ahead of time. And they focused on simulations such as uh, a man in a bike tree collision accident with head trauma. How do we, how do we respond to that? How, we focused on a woman who was dehydrated from spending too much time in the sun. And they also trained people on how to manage an infant with head injury from a bike accident. So those are just examples of the kind of training that's being provided in these simulation vehicles. They will be on the move all year long, going across not just the rag by rag by route, but across the whole state of Iowa. And I think this is an important aspect of how do we get training out into local communities. Okay, next slide. Moving away from healthcare, one of the other activities that we're really proud of is our Iowa Initiative for Sustainable Communities. It's in its 13th year. And what we do with this program is we essentially go out into communities, we listen to what the community's needs are, we bring a team of students and faculty and experts out into the community, and then work on thorny problems that the community is faced with in terms of thinking about how to enrich the lived experiences of people in those rural areas. Uh, we've spent a lot of time on this program over 13 years. We, we uh, estimate that we've had about 316 projects in 50 communities. You can see all the dots on the map and that we've included over 2000 students to date in these projects. And they really are rolling up sleeves, sitting down with community leaders and saying, what are your issues? How can we help? How can we bring experts uh, to the communities to solve problems? So next slide, I'll give you a sense or an example of one of those this past year to make it a little bit more uh, cogent, if you will. One group worked with Jackson County over the last year and a half, and we had two students engaged in these partnerships uh, with Maquoketa River Watershed Management Authority and Jackson County Economic Alliance. Uh, more than 200 students moved out into this community, spent time uh, on 39 different projects, which included things like helping develop policies that will add new housing in this county, working engineering students working with a, on a master plan for undeveloped land, for economic development, and for watershed protection. And the goal really is don't preach, don't tell people what we think they should do, but really go out into the communities ask them what the issues are that they're facing with and then making sure we bring experts as well as students out into these communities to really make a difference. Uh, it's Hawkeyes on the move around the communities. Okay, next slide. The last example I wanna share with you is just uh, in addition to the great center that you just approved the new name for uh, with regard to school mental health, we are so appreciative to the Scanlon Foundation for that amazing funding. Uh, we're not just working on mental health, we're doing other things as well. And this is a great example of a program that's been around for 37 years. Uh, it's the UI Wildlife Instruction and Leadership Development or WILD program. This is a, a program that has presence in 39 different counties across the state with more than 5,600 students per year participating in this program. And the nice thing is we bring the program to where students are. It's a week-long learning experience, essentially a camp. Students learn about uh, the outdoors, conservation of birds, water sampling, 
uh, archaeology and how we dig for different elements in the earth. And it includes teachers who are actually in their practic practicum experiences from the College of Education. So it's a win-win. It helps our, our students get real life experience. And it also helps all of these young people really think deeply about nature and about the, the world that we live in. So uh, that's a hugely successful program and will continue on for a long time. Next slide. So that's the end of my brief remarks. We could go on and on about other examples of impact, which I've done in the past, but I just wanted to give you a sense of some of the highlights from this summer and what we're proud about in terms of our outreach. And I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Are there any questions for President? Sure. Uh, President Regent Wilson, Parker. thank you. Uh, President Wilson, on the simulation in motion trucks, who uh, who's the target? For that, I mean, who will be trained? Is that sort of ordinary people who want to learn, or uh, people with some training who want to, you know, beef up their training or get training in areas that they're not familiar with? Yeah, that's a great, great question, Regent Barker. I think right now the focus will be on healthcare workers because there's such a, a dearth of opportunities there. But I know in the Rag Bri, uh, route that they were helping train anybody who was interested. So at one stop, they had over 80 people sign up who just wanted to learn about head trauma and how to manage dehydration. I think once we get to the point where we feel like we've um, served the healthcare community, we will work beyond that. But at this point, we have so many people in the healthcare industry that need the simulation training that they will be our priority at the first at the front end. So people who are in healthcare but might need more training in some particular area. Absolutely. That's, that's great. I, I also wanted to say that uh, my kids were in that uh, the wild program and loved it. Still talk about it years later. That's great to hear. Thank you. Any other questions for President Wilson? Uh, at this time, we're a little ahead of schedule, not much, but we'll take about a 10 minute break uh, and be back here then in 10 minutes. Recording stop.
Testing in uh, progress. Do I have to hit the hammer? <laughs> uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize Brad Berg uh, from the board office, who is uh, has a topic of interest to everyone. Thank you, President Richards and members of the board. Uh, before you today is the second and final reading of the proposed tuition mandatory fees and common and university specific fees for the 2022-23 academic year. All tuition and mandatory fee rates before you today remain unchanged to those of the first reading heard by the board in June. Uh, the base undergraduate resident tuition rates include a $355 increase to a new rate of $8,711 at the University of Iowa, $354 increase to $8,678 at Iowa State, and an increase of $331 uh, to $8,111 at UNI. The docket also includes varying increases to other student categories, differential tuition for higher cost programs, and mandatory fees as provided in the docket. The board's also asked to approve the allocation of student activities and service fees and the building fees as recommended by the student fee committees at each of the, of the institutions. So with that, I would be happy to respond to any questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Berg? Um, I think if we look over the last couple of years, our increases will be less than the cumulative increase in HEPI or certainly CPI. Would that be right? Yes, that has been the case. Um, you know, we, we're working off uh, HEPI projections as, as completed by uh, an economic analysis done at the University of Iowa. And at, at that last report, uh, HEPI was projected to be 3.7% for the 2022-23 um, academic year. But this year, you know, we did exceed happy a little bit. Um, uh, or that you projection. you average that over the last but couple yes, of years. Yes, but if you yeah. average that over the last several years, we have been below happy. That's correct. Are there any other questions? Hearing none, uh, I would like to state the following. A motion and the second are required to approve the following. The A, the proposed tuition and mandatory fees for 2022-2023 in academic year as outlined in the agenda item effective with the fall 2022 session. B, the allocation of Regent University's mandatory student fees for the 2022-23 academic year as outlined in the agenda item. And C, the proposed common and university and program specific fees for the 2022-23 academic year as outlined in the agenda item. Is there a motion? I so move. Motion by Regent Bates. Second. Sir, second by Regent Rouse. Is there any discussion? We've had a lot of discussion. We know that. Yeah. yeah so. Uh, roll call vote, uh, Regent Barker? Yes. Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Butker? Yes. Regent Crow? Yes. Regent Ricewick? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Rouse? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. And now we uh, have Brad Berg from the Regents Office who will discuss uh, the budgets. Thank you again. Uh, I realize there's a lot of information in the docket, but uh, I will be brief. Um, before you today are the FY 2023 University and Special School Operating and Restricted Fund budgets that total 6.9 billion. Uh, included in the budgets are, are an aggregate $5.5 million increase in state appropriations that support gen the general education funds at the universities, uh, which is a 1.1% increase for each university and an aggregate $413,000 uh, in incremental funding for the special schools. 
The restricted budgets in part include state capital funding for UNI's industrial tech center at UNI and the vet diagnostic lab at, at Iowa State, uh, as well as, as the last installment of the student innovation center at, at Iowa State. While the restricted budgets incorporate auxiliary enterprise budgets, such as athletics and the residence systems, there are separate budgets for these major units uh, in the docket as well. And with that, I would be happy to respond to any questions. Regent Rouse. Um, I have one question for the University of Iowa, um, the athletics budget. Um, I was just wondering if we could get an update on the $50 million loan that was given from the university to mm -hmm. athletics, just the status of that. Yeah, certainly. Um, uh, I'm glad to um, give some update and some detail on that to take maybe even a step back a little bit. Recall that following COVID with the requirement or actually um, uh, the requirement for us to do an internal loan because external loans for this would, would not be allowed by Iowa code, uh, we arranged for a $50 million um, loan agreement uh, over a 15 year period with a commercially peer rated or peer amount um, uh, interest. Um, no, uh, no penalties for paying early and, and paying it off early and the athletic department has objectives to do so. Uh, we, are, we meet with the athletic department, our CFO, Terry Johnson with theirs, on an annual basis and on a fiscal year basis, the payments are made. We have um, already executed the first payment on that. It was in the amount of $3 million. Uh, the amounts will move up in future years, but the athletic department is still within the challenges of the immediate uh, following of, of COVID impacts uh, to the uh, department as a whole. So this first year payment already completed at um, $3 million. And each year we will reevaluate and continue toward the um, 15 year payoff. And as I mentioned, the athletic department intends to pay that off early if they're able. Thank you. Certainly. Okay. Regent Bates. Yeah, I'd just like to piggyback off of uh, Regent Rouse. She had asked what I was wondering, will that be a line item in that budget so that it can easily be seen in future times? Is And is it within uh, this budget someplace that we don't see it? The payment of that. I, I will um, will make sure that it's reported as a part of their annual um, budget from uh, delivered to us from the athletic department coordinated with our CFO, uh, uh, Terry Johnson, can certainly be uh, either footnoted or called out as a line item. And, and uh, okay. you can count uh, on it being included, yes. Okay, thank you. Regent. <laughs> um, so I had a question for um, sort of all of the universities that in some of the general operating budget places, there's mentions of different projected revenues and recoveries totaling um, 20 million, 30 million in different spots. And I'm wondering if these monies are reinvested back into the buckets that we've garnered them from, or how else are we realizing these um, recoveries? And money? For perspective for numbers, it's for Iowa pages nine and 10 of the docket and um, ISU 28 and 29, some of those numbers. Regent Crow, are you speaking of the indirect cost recoveries from yeah. um, that and uh, mentions, I think, tuition and enrollment change um, projections? Well, in, in, in the most general sense, all of those contribute to the general fund of the university and are invested directly into, and I believe you've got, for instance, in your docket information, page 11 um, spells out the general university spending by function for the University of Iowa, which would be in effect the reinvestment of the dollars earned through revenue uh, from the various sources that do include tuition uh, primarily, uh, tuition revenues are uh, state appropriations and the indirects related to research. And as you can see, I think what I would highlight from that, um, you can see the top line item in instruction, direct impact to the students at the University of Iowa, garnering 37% of that. But 
going down that line, two of the other major contributors at 17% uh, in the middle of the line, academic support directly toward the students of our campus and scholarships and fellowships, same thing. Um, I think you know you, it does also include the general fund, the care for our 250 buildings on our campus. You can see the operations and maintenance costs, not an insignificant investment on this campus, but um, vastly the um, reinvestments in our campus through the general fund are for the excellence and, and success of our students. Thank you, Regent Grove, Regent Barker. Oh, uh, excuse me, uh, President Wilson, did you have a comment? Okay, Regent Barker. Sure, um, I'm just looking at the, uh, the chart in here that shows the <clears throat> breakdown between appropriations and tuition. And I just wanted to point out, that, you know, this looked like, uh, this chart looked very dramatic five years ago uh, as a you know, decline in appropriations as a percentage of the budget increase in tuition. But over the last five years, that has uh, really stabilized uh, and, and even a slight reversal uh, in that trend. So I just thought that was uh, an interesting uh, aspect of, uh, you know, we've been following this graph for uh, quite a while now. I will just add that I will update this graph uh, within the next couple of months when we get actuals for fiscal year 2022. Any other questions or to the uh, participants on the call? Hearing none, will uh, a motion and a second are re required to approve the budgets as outlined in the agenda item. Is there a motion? I'll make the motion. Regent Bates. Is there a second? Second. Regent Barker. Any discussion? Any further discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. Regent Barker? Yes. Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Butker? Yes. Regent Crow? Yes. Regent Ryswick? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Rouse? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Re Regent Richards votes yes. At this time, I would like to recognize Regent Bates, who will run the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics meeting. Thank you. I believe I see everybody on that's from UIHC and University of Iowa. Okay. So our first item uh, is approval of the minutes from the June 1st, 2022 meeting. Are there any questions or corrections? If not, the minutes are approved by general consent. And now I welcome Dr. Brooks Jackson, Vice President for Medical Affairs and Time Road D Arts Dean, Carver College of Medicine. So I'll turn the floor over to you, Dr. Jackson. Thank you very much, uh, Regent Bates and uh, fellow regents. I'm pleased to be here today and I'm joined by uh, Kim Hunter, Interim Senior Associate Vice President for UI Healthcare and Chief Executive Officer, as well as Chief Nurse Executive for UI Hospitals and Clinics. Also, Mark Henricks, UI Healthcare's Associate Vice President for Finance and Chief Financial Officer, and Rod Leonard, Senior Vice President and University Architect. Today, we will give an update on UIHC's operating and financial performance and an update on the North Liberty Hospital construction project, progress and budget issues. We will start with presentations from Kim Hunter and Mark Henricks on operating and financial performance. So Kim, I'll turn it over to you at this point. Great, thank you, Dr. Jackson. So we're really happy to be here with you again. We'll go to the next slide, please. And then the next slide. Great. And the next slide. All right, we're where we need to be. Thank you so much. Um, you know, at our last meeting, and which was back in June, we provided the board with an overview of the last calendar year um, of UIHC's service to our patients. And then for today's meeting, we'd like to tell you more about how UIHC is supporting the state of Iowa's Medicaid beneficiaries. So our Iowa Medicaid beneficiaries 
uh, make up a significant portion of the patients that we serve at UIHC, and they continue to increase year over year. And as the needs of this patient population increases, we remain um, committed to supporting our Medicaid patients and to continuing to fulfill our mission to those patients and all citizens of Iowa. So we're really honored, um, as you know, to serve the state and our patients um, in this capacity. And we're excited to tell you about some of our upcoming plans. So we'll go to the next slide. And then the next one. All right. So today we'd like to talk with the board about seven key factors and how UIHC is supporting and will continue to support Iowa Medicaid beneficiaries. Uh, we will talk about each of these seven factors you see individually, but in total, these are the key contributing factors that we are working to address um, in conjunction with the university, the board, and all of our state leaders to ensure that UIHC is able to continue to treat all Iowans, regardless of their ability to pay. And as the largest safety net hospital for Iowa, we pay a, play a key role in caring for and supporting our Iowa Medicaid beneficiaries. So we'll go to the next slide. So the first key factor impacting UIHC and supporting our Iowa Medicaid patients is that UIH, at UIHC, Medicaid demand is growing faster than our access to healthcare services. And so what that means is even though we try really hard each year to recruit more physicians and open more appointments and improve our efficiencies to care and support more patients, we are unable to create this access fast enough. And this applies to all patients that seek care at UIHC, but we know that our Medicaid patients have unique care needs and vulnerabilities, and we strive to meet those. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see that the total number of Iowa Medicaid encounters at UIHC increased by almost 30% from the years 2017 to 2021. And so we grew from about 214,000 visits to around 280,000 visits. And so that represents a growth of about 66,000 visits in um, just five years. And so the challenge with this growth is that our physical capacity to provide care to these patients didn't grow at the same rate. So prior to the COVID pandemic, you see on the right-hand side of the screen, we know that there were um, a, a little more than 6,000 Medicaid beneficiaries who left the state for inpatient care. And so what this tells us really is that the capacity within our state to provide services for that patient population is constrained and it will be continued to be constrained in years to come if the pace of the growth of those patients um, continues. We'll go to the next slide. So um, UIHC is Iowa's only academic medical center and it's the state's single largest Medicaid and safety net provider. So, you know, we're really proud of the role that we play there and we're honored to be a resource for all of our um, patients. And we provide a lot of complex care that um, only we can provide for the citizens of our state. And, you know, we know and we really appreciate and value the contribution of other provider, healthcare providers in our state because, you know, patients, just like us, you want to receive your care close to home. And it's important that that continue. But when there is need for the complex care that we can provide, we want to be able to uh, take those patients and be able to deliver the care that they need and then return them to their communities. And so, on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see that we care for about 1,100 medication, Medicaid patients per day. And so, uh, you know, almost 800 travel to us each day from different places to receive clinic visits and care there. And then we care for about 186 patients um, in the hospital each day, patients of all ages. And really, if you, uh, you might think, well, probably a lot of those come from Johnson County, and that's really not true. Only about 22% of those Medicaid beneficiaries are from Johnson County. And so our service to those patients from all across the state um, persist. And we've worked really hard 
during the pandemic to provide telemedicine visits for this patient population. And you can see that we do um, 80 or so of those per day. I want to talk to you just a little bit. So, you know, I'm a real patient advocate, and I think it's good to understand the types of things that we do for patients. It's easier to relate to that. So the pictures on the left really portray some of these things. So the top left-hand corner really is a picture of a patient in an ambulatory or outpatient uh, setting. And so our Iowa Medicaid beneficiaries um, in the last calendar year traveled from over 99 counties, all 99 counties to receive outpatient care here. And then the top right-hand picture um, is a picture of a behavioral health unit we opened. And I know in the June meeting, I talked to you about our crisis stabilization unit that they have. But let me kind of tell you what types of complex behavioral health ca uh, care we provide. So um, in the recent months, we had a patient that was transferred to us from the Des Moines area. And the providers in Des Moines thought that this patient had a severe bipolar disorder and wanted the patient to come here for evaluation. And we said, absolutely. And, and we took care of this patient. The type of specialist we have and, and the technology we had was put to use. And so the providers through all of their diagnostic workup on this patient determined that this patient had some antibodies in his spinal fluid and those antibodies were in fact attacking his brain. And that was a source of uh, the outward um, clinical signs that were seen in this patient. And so through different IV medications and other therapy here, this patient began to improve. And oh, by the way, this patient was COVID positive the entire time he was with us. And so you can see that the care we provided was complex and we're happy that we were able to help this patient and return him to his uh, home. The bottom right-hand corner is an example of um, good maternal um, care that we provide. So this is an actual patient that we had. She uh, was pregnant, she contracted COVID, and unfortunately she was very, very ill with that and was in our medical intensive care unit on very uh, complex treatment. Um, the great news is that through the care of all of our providers and the team of people working together, uh, she survived uh, that illness and delivered a healthy baby. And, um, and so we're proud of that as well. And then the bottom left-hand side really just shows that we take care of the tiniest little people here too. And we're really proud of that. So you know that we're the only level four neonatal ICU in the state. And um, as we know, certain birthing centers um, are across the state are closing. And so uh, the care that we provide, um, not only labor and delivery, but neonatal ICU um, continues to be very important. We'll go to the next slide. So the charts that you see on this page um, are the total number of Medicaid patients seen at UIHC in calendar year 2021. And so um, the bottom left-hand uh, corner, you see that our Medicaid surgical volumes increased um, each year, uh, about 4% in total. And we are constrained still to continue to serve even more patients. So we're seeing significant growth in our clinic visits. The top left-hand corner, we see, we've see we seen about a 21% growth in the Medicaid patient population seeking care here. And then a good news story is the top right-hand corner shows you the Medicaid emergency department visits. And so you see that that is a decline um, of about 22% over the same um, period from 2017 to 2021. And this is good in that Medicaid beneficiaries um, still need the care, but they seek it in other areas like our quick cares, our urgent cares and primary care visits that we offer, rather than going to the emergency department for things that can be cared for just as well in other places. And then the bottom right hand corner, I wanted to highlight the Medicaid inpatient days. That total volume has increased almost 11% since 2017. And what that means is um, there are an additional 21 patients a day um, in the hospital right now uh, compared to 2017 who are seeking inpatient care. 
and um, we are very full in the inpatient side and use, you know, 95 to 97 percent of all of our space, um, all of the time to do that, all of our beds. So we'll move along to the next slide. So we continue uh, to be capacity constrained and are not able to care for more Iowa Medicaid beneficiaries without expanding and renovating our facilities. And so we are good stewards of our resources, right? And so when you look at all of the square footage within UIHC, we're using 99% of it. And so what that means is we really don't have room to expand unless we um, build some new places to deliver care. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see our inpatient census. So there are a couple of things to point out. We know that in 2020, we had a dip in our inpatient census and that was really due to COVID. Um, but you can see that in 2021, our census continued um, to go up. We've added uh, about 44 beds across the period of time internally, and we have um, are a very, um, you know, have a 97% occupancy rate. And when you look at standards across the other hospitals and kind of an industry standard, it says if you have about a 75 to an 80% capacity, then you have enough wiggle room throughout your day to admit the patients that are coming in and coming through the emergency department. But once you rise above that level, it's very challenging uh, from a throughput perspective to take care of all of those patients as quickly as you would like. And so really without increased access, we'll continue to be challenged to care for more Medicaid beneficiaries in Iowa. Well, we'll go to the next slide. And so we've partnered with the state of Iowa um, to secure participation in a federal directed payment program for safety net providers. And, you know, we'd really like to thank Governor Reynolds and Kelly Garcia, who's director of the Iowa Department of Human Services and Department of Public Health, because they've been very supportive of this program um, and supportive of UIHC. And so UIHC will be provided supplemental funding to increase access to Iowa Medicaid beneficiaries and to support Iowa's Medicaid quality plan. And the primary use of this funding is to expand access and create capacity. We will identify additional opportunities to increase access and will align with best practices and will work to improve the quality of care of the patient seeking maternal and mental health services particularly. With this program, you know, it's federal funded uh, but with this program, we will um, have an annual reapplication process and then a review of our performance is required. Um, we anticipate that this Medicaid funding will substantially increase UIHC's margin over the coming years. And there are more than 30 other states in the country who already participate in this program. And so we're very happy that now we have the opportunity um, to uh, participate in it and help our Medicaid beneficiaries across the state. We'll go to the next slide. This next slide really illustrates three ways that these funds will be used uh, within our comprehensive facility plan um, over the next 10 years. And so we plan to increase access to our care uh, through facility expansion. So in doing that, um, North Liberty Campus uh, is part of the plan and, and expanding our physical footprint on the main campus is our plan. And you know, as I shared earlier, we're using about 99% of all of our space now. Um, and um, you know, we need to um, expand access through some additional spaces. Number, uh, the second uh, way that we'll do this is we'll align some best practices here and, and uh, work to meet standards that people expect um, within our industry. So we'll be modernizing existing spaces that we have. Um, one example of this is about 40% of our patient rooms uh, in our current hospital are semi-private now, right? And so um, there are a few reasons. Patients like to be in a room by themselves when they're ill and in the hospital. And then when we look at uh, the patient's experience, the privacy needs of patients, 
but also importantly, um, for infection control reasons, it's best to have private rooms. And so we will, um, through this expansion, be able to provide more private rooms. We also plan to expand our emergency department. Um, and um, we have a lot of patients um, in the emergency department each and every day. And uh, we plan to uh, expand the places in the emergency department that we can care for some of our behavioral health patients as well. And then lastly, I talked about improving the quality of care for maternal and mental health. These are two big priorities for our state. And so we want to um, in have increased access so that we can provide more timely care to patients. And then we'll be focusing on certain high-risk populations, which are really um, maternal patients and then mental health patients. And then um, in order to do that, one of the things that we'll do is increase the number of providers uh, taking care of those patients. And so we'll go to the next slide. And so, we, like I said, we're partnering with Iowa Medicaid um, and um, we'll work to improve the overall timely access to care. We have measures in place um, and uh, reporting uh, that we provide to show that we are improving that timely access. And we'll be focusing on expanding maternal health and uh, behavioral health uh, services for the patient population. And so we partner with Iowa Medicaid office um, to follow up on these plans um, to ensure that our quality and our access continues to improve. And so I will now turn this over to Mark Henricks to talk about our financial update. Thanks, Kim. Um, so kind of going to the next slide, just one addition, um, you know, um, working with Iowa Medicaid Enterprise, they've been highly engaged with, with us and working with CMS. And so I wanna um, thank them as well through this process of getting to the Medicaid directed payment. So the financial statements um, present today is gonna show the overall results um, with and without directed payment. And a couple of key overall messages for the April year to date financials. Overall, we're, the hospital's meeting its margin goal for the year um, before looking at directed payment. But beyond that, you'll kind of see the impact on directed payment as it's recognized in the overall margin, but it's key to keep in mind that's specifically tied to access and capital needs. As, as Kim mentioned, space capacity is an acute challenge we face every day here currently and, and in the future, we'll see that as well. So if we go to the next slide uh, with the highlights. There we go, thank you. Um, so I'll just point out a few highlights on this slide. So volumes, um, you know, we saw a, a big jump in acuity. Acuity has been increasing on the inpatient side year over year anyway, but we saw a, a more significant jump uh, with COVID. We see that flattening a little bit in the second half of the year, but still um, we see inpatient acuity above historical norms. Um, the other thing I mentioned on volumes, so we're running below budget. Um, we had some staffing constraints that resulted in the closing of four ORs for the second half of this fiscal year. Those rooms are planned to be brought back online over the next several several months, two in August and uh, two in November. Um, kind of on the expense side, you know, key element expenses is, is the inflationary impacts on salary and non-salary expenses. Um, and salary, we've talked about the increases in agency uh, with those expenses being over three times the norm. We are seeing uh, some stabilization impacts in specific recruitment efforts we're making, um, but that'll that'll be again a watch point continuing into next fiscal year. So if we go to the the actual financials through April on the next slide, so I'm going to start with kind of talking a little bit about the the highlighted summary section. So the first yellow highlight, you'll see the operating income of 370 million or 16.8%. So this is what's different as we kind of see the directed payment impact um, coming through the financials. Um, that's what is, is related to that 370 million. If you take those elements out, because as we started the conversation of the year and with the budget, there was not directed payments. Um, this shows without directed payments or overall margin about 100 million uh, or 5.2%. So the key takeaway there without directed payments is in spite of inflation challenges, we had a strong start in the first half of the year and we've been able to 
manage and maintain to meet the 3.9% margin overall. Um, however, expense trends experienced throughout the industry and you know here as well are going to continue to stress operating margins across healthcare. Um, so, th so that's kind of the broad conversation of the financials, kind of ultimately the margins with and without. So kind of coming back up to the upper section where we get into revenues, uh, I just want to focus on directed payments for a minute. So you can see the accrual noted in the second row of the financials. Um, and while this, uh, again, is part that flows through the financials, these are dollars that are, are specifically focused on increasing access. Um, you know, as Kim mentioned, physical capacity has been a material challenge. Um, and our capital investment needs need to be significantly more to meet the challenges, access challenges of today and, and going forward. So these dollars specifically focus on master facilities plan needs um, and access challenges going forward. We go to the uh, next slide, um, just kind of wrapping up with the key metrics as we look at our Moody's meeting peer group. Um, so the operating margin here reflects the change we just talked about with, with direct payment coming through the financials. Um, days cash on hand, uh, we're currently at 243 through April. From an in industry perspective, we've seen the medians kind of climb there. So the median right now is at 341 days. Historically, in, as we compare with our peer group, um, days cash is typically where we're a little bit under and age of plant, not listed here, but age of plant is where we're typically over. So we tend to have um, historically a little less cash on hand um, and our uh, age of plant tends to be uh, about 12 to 50% older than the peer group. The, the final uh, metric there, debt to cap. So you see debt to cap has grown a little bit where we're at 23%, so we're above current medians. So that would suggest that we're at a higher leverage position uh, versus our peer group. This is reflecting the impact of the debt issuance we did earlier in the calendar year. Um, as we project out the next several years, we see that our calculate ratio will trend back to ultimately we're in about two years, we expect to be uh, a little bit under that Moody's median overall. So those, those are all overall financial numbers and uh, comparison on the key metrics. If we wanna to go to the next slide. So Kim, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, Mark, so thank you. So just really in summary, um, you know, I hope you see that we are absolutely committed uh, to support Iowa Medicaid beneficiaries. And so what we've tried to illustrate today is that, you know, we're, we're proud to be able to participate in this federal directed payment program. Um, and really it's designed to support Medicaid beneficiaries and provide better access for them to the care that they need. And so we are partnering with the state of Iowa to increase the access care for those beneficiaries. And then we'll create additional access or alignment with our best practices and our future facility expansion. And so we feel certain about the need to serve Medicaid patients as all citizens of Iowa, and that we are using our funds in the right way to do just that. So we thank you for uh, listening to our presentation. Are there any questions for uh, Kim or Mark at this point? Uh, Regent Reiswick. <clears throat> Just a general question. When looking at uh, salary expenses, uh, are you seeing still the need for traveling nurses more so? Kim, do you want to start with that one? Certainly. <laughs> so we do have a need for uh, travel or agency nurses. And um, so when you look at the competition for labor um, across the nation for our hospitals and clinics, um, the, the competition is pretty fierce. And so we are working really hard uh, in our recruiting efforts, but we still have the need to utilize some agency nurses. And, um, and choose to do so, even though it's uh, cost a little bit more, but we choose to do that because we need to care for the patients who um, you know, need the care that only we can provide. And in order to do that, we choose to uh, supplement our staffing with some of the agency nurses so that we can continue to provide care to those patients. And we, we have seen agency rates trending downward some, but as Kim mentioned, like the opening of the new ORs and whatnot, there's elements that we're still 
relying on some level of agency that is still growing a little bit. Thank you. Uh, Bridget Dunkel. Thanks for the great presentation explaining why we need it and then showing the financial numbers that it's you're prepared for this. Um, Kim, you said that there was going to be reporting that was going to be necessary. Is that reporting that you're just going to be doing like written reports sent in or will they do visitations? Do you know or both? So um, I, I don't believe there are uh, physical visits, uh, but there is reporting um, and data that we submit. And I know Mark could speak a little bit more to that. Sure. So um, we meet regularly with Iowa Medicaid um, every two weeks where we talk about trending and whatnot. Um, the reporting to uh, CMS happens once a year. Um, so we're trending, we're, we're tracking our access and our uh, quality data internally. We're continually talking to Iowa Medicaid. And as we see opportunities to, um, on their side or our side, to look at different options to further increase access, uh, we continually discuss those. But as far as uh, CMS doing final reviews, they do a final review of each year's um, basically one time a year. But they go through, as we do a renewal each year, they're highly involved in discussing what the metrics for the next upcoming year would be. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, if you want to go ahead with the second part of your presentation. Okay. So then we just open it up real quickly, Kim, and um, we we are the second part of our presentation concerns the North Liberty Project, and uh, President Richards already alluded to it earlier in the in the regular meeting. We're coming before the board today to request an increase in our budget for this project. We don't do this lightly. We've done a lot of work uh, on constraining our expenditures, but the issues related to the construction industry and supply industry uh, means that we are uh, we're under under budget and what we originally requested and we need to come before you and give you an update and a request for an increase. Um, you've heard that 99% of our space is being utilized for patient care. We're turning patients away. We desperately need the space for North Liberty and we're excited to keep going, but we're gonna have to adjust the budget. So I'm gonna turn it over to our colleagues. We've got a whole team. We'll start with Brooks. And then I think Brooks, you're gonna turn it over maybe to Kim and then Mark and, and Rod. So we have a lot of folks who are gonna present as part of this request. So yeah, we'll just turn this right over to, to Kim um, to start. Right. All right. So. Um, uh, like President Wilson just said, and in our prior presentation, we talked about the need for greater access to care. Um, and so part of our, comp we have a comprehensive plan really that involves the main campus, but it also involves North Liberty in order to provide access to care that Iowans need. And so the, so much of what we focus on is complex care uh, that patients receive from us. So we'll go to our next slide. And on this next slide, you'll see a picture, uh, two pictures actually, of what the North Liberty campus looks like at this point. So um, all of the, there is a lot underway related to this. And so uh, some of the things that we think is really important for you to know is that um, it's having North Liberty is consistent with our mission and what we need to do to take care of patients. The scope of the building of the project has not changed since the Board of Regents uh, approved this um, in you know last year. It's the same building design, the same square footage and the same floor plan. And so no changes within the building. Uh, the one thing that is different with this uh, particular um, budget and there's a line item that I know Rod will address is um, there's some modifications that need to be done for an intersection. Uh, for traffic flow reasons. And so that's added into this. Other than that, there is no change and no, no change at all within the buildings. And so we all know what we hear on the news and what we ex all experience at the gas station and in the grocery store and the construction industry has challenges as well, right? With inflation, not only in the United States, but worldwide, 
Uh, the prices of raw materials continue to climb and the availability of them is more challenging. And then just as we talked about, uh, about the need for people to work and care for patients, uh, the local trade labor um, areas are experiencing shortages of workers as well. So the status is that our construction is underway, which we you see from the pictures. And then we have a remaining bids, about 35, that we will receive um, by, by the end of August from the construction manager at risk. We'll go to the next slide. So when uh, we look at our budget and a change to that, one of the things we do is say, hmm, should we stop and wait for the market to change? And so we really considered that, but understand that the impact of delaying our project um, has a, is significant on patient care. So how um, healthcare access for Iowans uh, would be reduced and the complexity uh, or providing complex care to our patients is already strained and this would further strain that. And you know, we have about 24, last year we had about 2,400 uh, transfer requests of patients from across the state uh, to come here and uh, we weren't able to take them and that was really because of capacity constraints. Um, we anticipate that construction costs will continue to increase and increase you know, past August 1st and future costs remain unclear. So we know that the uh, world, uh, there are wars uh, with Russia and Ukraine and uh, wouldn't you know it, they're the third and the fourth largest aluminum producers in the world. And that impacts multiple building systems. Uh, we have a shortage of electricians locally and um, only have about 25% locally of what we need for this particular project. And then uh, just as an example, glass goes into homes and buildings and hospitals, and there's about a 30 to 40% increase in glass costs just um, since the end of June. So this uh, just helps illustrate some of the changes that we're seeing. So we'll go to the next slide. And then we talk about, well, should we reduce the size of the project? And we've looked carefully at this. And so North Liberty, um, when you look at the square footage, 93% of all of that is dedicated to patient and research serving space. And so that's uh, patient care and research, not research uh, that's more bench research, but research that really does impact patients in care that impacts their quality of life, uh, gives them access to treatments they couldn't otherwise receive. And so it's important to be able to deliver that. If we reduce the clinical space, uh, we would have to then uh, continue to care for more patients on main campus and, and we're constrained there. And then it really would diminish our educational and research mission, which is important to us at UIHC. And so the remaining 7% of the um, building is uh, provider and physician office space and educational space. And so um, really most of the building is dedicated to patients and therefore uh, we really are not able, I uh, don't think it's wise to do anything to reduce the size of it. When you look at infrastructure in a building, you still need the guts of the building to work. And so we still need the same HVAC and plumbing and electrical services. And even if we decided to shell certain spaces in the building, it wouldn't impact needing those systems in place. They have to be placed in the building, um, you know, before anything else is done. So we'll go to the next slide and I'm gonna turn this over to Rod Leonard's. Thank you, Kim. <clears throat> I um, <clears throat> want to actually accent a point that Kim made. In addition to the challenges of um, of shelling the space, <clears throat> once you have a hospital under operation, we learn this every day in the main hospital, disruptions to the services of the patient care to go back in and do projects later, often at a higher cost, uh, turn into uh, later regrets. Um, and, and so to that end, and with the points that uh, Kim has made, um, our recommendation and our recommendation to the board is to advance the project, to continue the project forward with the construction manager at risk uh, delivery method that the board approved at the onset of the project and the protections that that uh, affords. Some of those are highlighted here. First and foremost, it is a very open book system. Uh, we have a CM at risk, J.E. Dunn, 
who manages, does self-performance, but also manages all of the packages and the bids that um, are executed on this project. There are a total of 64 bids that are required or bid packages to execute this, and half of those have been um, bid, have been received and awarded and are moving forward, as Kim said, in a project that is in process now. Uh, when those bids are open, we're there for the bids for the bid openings. We witness all of those. We work with the CEM at risk to evaluate the low bidders for all of the remaining packages. Uh, this uh, final effort that we're looking toward is a final bid package collection of, of the remaining uh, half of this project. Uh, after the bids are received, we're able to work with the selected and chosen subcontractors to do additional value engineering. I think it should be noted that while, as Kim highlighted, no scope has changed, we have worked hard with the designers and with J.E. Dunn to do value engineering to try to tighten the belt of an existing floor plan. And we can continue to do that, and those savings are, are generated to change orders that benefit um, the university and UIHC. Uh, we will be reporting to the Board of Regents all of those bid uh, awards as these final more than 30 packages are received all within about a month's time. And um, the cost savings uh, versus that final GMP, the guaranteed maximum price that we've spoken about, will be to the benefit of, of the university. And as we receive those and award those bids, this will allow us an opportunity to return to the Board of Regents with what we hope or expect will be a revised budget downward reflecting the realities of the bids to, to come in. This guaranteed maximum price, or GMP, as it's referred to in the CM at risk process, uh, is it locks in, as it says, a worst case cost for us until, October, uh, until August 1st. Um, at, at that point, the CM at risk, J.E. Dunn, will reevaluate their costs in uh, context with these worldwide regional and local construction market challenges. Some of those um, worsening since they delivered the uh, GMP cost to us. And um, the benefit of this, of this GMP is that it protects us from future escalations. Once the GMP is locked in, then as these bids are received, should the bids exceed the projections of, um, of J.E. Dunn's, J.E. Dunn is held responsible for those additional costs. And as we said, if those bids come in below that, we're able to adjust our budget downward um, and, and make deductive change orders uh, in the contract. Um, one small example, not small, but in relative sense, the site work, which included eight bids already executed, did result in a positive outcome. Construction bids coming in, as you can see, 2.9 million below the Board of Regents budget based on the estimate for uh, that portion of the work. And all of those savings will benefit the overall guaranteed maximum price uh, result for the University of Iowa. Um, with that, we'll go to the next slide and I will hand it off to Mark. If you want to cover, Mark, the, uh, the request for the budget sure. increase we're talking about. Yeah. Thanks, Rod. So, yeah, so down to what does this specifically mean in dollar impact? So the updated budget requests uh, we're making for today is at 525.6 million. Um, you know, has, as has been discussed, it's a unique environment we're in, and there's, there's been a lot of work in um, really looking at minimizing the impact, but the inflation challenges are real. Um, given the CM at risk arrangement, you know, this, this should be the worst case, um, especially as we look at the construction lines and whatnot with that guaranteed maximum price. So there, there's a key focus going forward, as, as Roz mentioned, of, as those bids are received review. I mean, there, there's a lot of effort here to make sure we look at every opportunity to take this down. Uh, but this is, we've kind of locked in, if we went this route, we've locked in with the CM at risk, our level on the, on the top side of risk, um, inflation going further than we see here. Um, I would just mention as well, you know, this increased costs and inflation environment is creating a challenge here, but big picture for this project and the link to meeting the capacity and access needs of the institution, the project still is one that remains vital when we look at our, you know, five and 10 year plans overall and meeting the access needs overall. If we go to the next slide, just one other thing for context. So this is an analysis of looking at other projects 
And you can see we're not alone either in the heart in the healthcare industry. So we've got similar kind of hospital projects and other healthcare projects. You can see, you know, the increases where ours is at 33% with this, you know, that we see, we're seeing that across the country quite a bit. And just some examples as well as recent UI bids as well in the, the wrestling training facility um, and some operating room expansion. So it, it's it's a challenge here. It's a challenge uh, nationally. Um, but I just want to provide the numbers overall. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kim. Thank you, Mark. So the next slide, please. So through renovations and modernizations, we plan to, uh, at UIHC, create additional uh, patient access on main campus and the North Liberty. So the North Liberty project will add a little over 412,000 square feet to our ability to care for patients, and it increases access for complex and emergency care for Iowans, and um, the access is actually more efficient for many patients. Um, at the North Liberty campus compared to the main campus. Um, just thinking traversing the area and parking and maneuvering through a lot of places. And so on the main campus though, we also uh, plan to create additional patient access over 180,000 square feet through renovations and modernization. So you can see from this slide, over the next years, we plan to add more inpatient beds, more clinic uh, exam rooms, and then we'll have 11 more operating rooms to use. Um, and so really together, uh, this plan for North Liberty and main campus will enable us to serve more patients. And it brings together the comprehensive resources uh, that only UIHC can offer to the citizens of Iowa. And so we really appreciate your consideration of this request today. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, Linda Meyer. Regent Linda Meyer. <laughs> I, I have a uh, question. Well, I, I did that with. Abby, too, because I started out to say Abby. Uh, uh, I was going to say Jim. I just thought it was because I missed a meeting. You forgot. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I was going to say Jim. I'm sorry. Uh, my question relate if, if there's no change in the size and scope of the project, what's the rationale for the increase in the design and management fee of about $4 million? Uh, how do you enjoy it? I can take that very quickly. One of the things we've noticed, and Mark, you, you may want to add to it as well, but one of the things that we have um, uh, called out on that slide that highlights that is, is the relative impact. It, there's several line items, but the relative impact as a part of the project actually reduces that line item from 17% of the project to 12.8% of it. But there are um, also included within that number through our study is the timing of the completion of the project. One thing to note, the project includes two major components. One, a hospital complex or a hospital building, and then two, a central utility plant building. And the timing for these two and the delivery of their packages means that we will have a utility system building that will be finished before the um, full building is opened at um, uh, on in the hospital. And so part of this is also accounting for the costs for the operations of that during the pre-opening period. And so there are utility costs, some of those costs associated with our area um, utility companies that provide uh, um, power, for instance, to this site. And so there are costs there that, that close the gap. That's one of or part of the costs that close the gap for the um, uh, time period between uh, the activation of the central utility plant and the, if you will, ribbon cutting or opening the doors of, of the new building. Regent Becker. Thank you, thank you. Um, even though there's no change orders right now, can you explain to us how change orders in the future will take place and how that may be different than the children's hospital. Okay, yeah, uh, Regent Butker, thank you for the question. I think there are a couple of, of notes in your question I'll, I'll try to address. 
Uh, first, again, looking at that same page, we were just talking about the budget request, uh, the bottom line item, construction contingency, uh, you'll note that it is held constant, making it a um, smaller percentage of, of the project in the end. The construction stage contingency is intended to protect the interests of this project and the university um, for unknowns during a, a project construction phase. Um, it's generally made up of and change orders to a project are generally made up of four categories. Uh, they are errors and omissions, as perfect as we want the collection of many engineers and architects to be spot on, and they work to be spot on. Within the industry, there are errors and omissions that are found in coordination, and you protect yourself to make sure that you've got those covered. Um, the second would be unforeseen conditions. Now, we're, we're somewhat fortunate on that front in that the early packages have got us in the ground, so to speak, so you... Uh, eliminate some of the typical um, unforeseen condition um, items that come up where you might discover something under the ground that you didn't expect was there and have to mitigate those issues. Um, within the healthcare industry and healthcare projects, somewhat unique to these, but also the duration of a project like this, there's also codes and regulatory compliance matters that may change during the course of a project. Healthcare endures this more than most building types. And for a project where we're intending to open it in 2025, we've got a period of time where some of these can come up. Not knowing specifically what they might be or that there would be any, we do protect ourselves with those kinds of changes. And finally, uh, Regent Butker is the, is the matter of owner, um, owner created, owner oriented changes where, where the university or the hospital makes change requests that would change the scope during the project. Um, we work on this campus to minimize this. I think one of the tools that you should be reassured by on this front is for a project of this scale, um, any change order over 100,000 requires not just the on-campus review we will have, but also uh, the executive director of the Board of Regents has to approve uh, changes over $100,000. Um, you mentioned the Children's Hospital. Since the delivery of the Children's Hospital, we've consolidated the campus project management processes on our campus. We partner with UIHC and their capital management office to make sure we're attending to the needs of UIHC, which are certainly particular and unique in the construction uh, and, and the design world but to follow best practice procedures and, and well-rounded review. So as some of these come up, a, um, an unforeseen condition, we have to take care of that, a regulatory compliance, we have to take care of that. When it comes to owner-oriented or owner-generated changes, we will review those. I will review those on this um, meeting today. David Keft, our business manager, executes those in coordination with the Board of Regents office. And so we will... Uh, tie those together and, and ensure that the intent is we return as much of the construction contingency at the end of this project as is possible. Thank you. Just a, a little follow up. What if there are additional costs or if the construction goes beyond the time frame? Yeah, I, uh, well, I think, I think what you may be asking is about this CM at risk process. I think, exactly. the, yeah, the, the, the two benefits and the protections we have are on the cost of the project and uh, the timing of the project. Um, on the cost front, as has been discussed, the GMP, and this would be the final GMP, the one that we would lock in before August 1st or by August 1st, we'll lock in as we've cast it here a worst case. If costs continue to go up after August 1st, if the 30 uh, or more bid packages to be received once we execute this um, come in higher. So any of them come in higher than expected. We're only responsible for what the GMP says. The, um, the construction manager at risk, uh, J.E. Dunn, is held responsible for those additional cost elements. We would have to specifically ask for changes in scope for J.E. Dunn to adjust their number, which is another reason why we should be doing everything we can to minimize or eliminate any owner-oriented changes. Um, with respect to the schedule, 
the contract for the CMF risk does not specifically have liquidated damages. This is a contract that is a Board of Regents contract. Um, does not have liquidated damages, but does have limited consequential damages. So for instance, if we found that there were delay delays on the project, project site with the subcontractors for packages, and the project was going to come in later, and we had revenue generation uh, damages, we're able to pursue those through the process of the consequential damages clause. Um, and and um, those are a couple of the protections that are specific to the question you asked, Regent Butker. Uh, but a, a for a project of this scale and this complexity, um, as we had requested at the onset of this project, an important one to have delivered as a as a CM at risk. Keep in mind, Kinnick Stadium was done similarly, and we had bids come in below the GMP and um, the uncommitted buyout, as it's called, resulted in deductive change orders uh, from the contract with, with the contractor and Kinnick, and would be the same thing when we do this project. And as I said, when we realize those bids in roughly a month from now, we'll know where we stand, and that will allow us to assess and come back to the Board of Regents with the results and hopefully a revised downward budget. I have one just follow-up question, Rod. Uh, yes. When would you anticipate, uh, give us a little bit more on that timeline. These are locked in through August 1st, but then they have to go out and get the, the a bid and Absolutely. when do you anticipate? I, I'm not trying to get. I'm not trying to get you tightly tied down. I just want to understand the sequence here. Yeah. Um, thank you, Regent Richards. We we um, we are pretty tight on it. We've been working with Jay Dunn a lot throughout this entire project of the and right now and we and as Kim communicated, roughly 35. We've been between 30 and 35 remaining bids. The current number is 32. Of the bids we have, <clears throat> they will on, when, when we lock in with the GMP on or before August 1st, J.E. Dunn will be coordinating those final 32 bid packages to go out on the streets on the 4th of August, right away after that. Those bids will be received in three different periods actually i think four different periods i've got it here yeah four different tiers of timing related to the kinds of bids the sizes of the bids on the 24th of august we will receive the first tranche of those bids i think it's roughly 10 of the bids will be received on the 24th of august we're scheduled to receive the next set of bids on the 31st of august one more set of bids on the 7th of September and the final smaller group of bids to be received on the 14th of September. So by that date, we will have received all the remaining 32 bids for this, for this project and we'll be able to and have then uh, assessed the receipt of those bids, where they stand against the GMP and we'll work with Jay Dunn on the report we'll bring back to the board on the results of those. Thank you, uh, Regent Barker. Um, thanks. Uh, I have two things. First, I didn't quite understand the answer to Regent Lindenme Lindenmeyer's question. Um, it sounded like we're adding in the design of a utility system. And so does that mean that we shouldn't consider that part an, an increase in the cost, but we're adding something that we didn't have before? I just wasn't sure what that was. And the second question is, Right, uh, Kim's presentation, I thought was a really powerful reminder of you know, the good things that are done at UIHC. Um, but the, um, we, we can't do those good things unless we're financially self-sustaining. Uh, we know that the project was self-sustaining before at the original cost. Uh, so at the, but with this new increase in cost, we're gonna have additional interest costs, we'll have additional depreciation costs. With those additional costs, is the project still financially self-sustaining and does it still contribute to the financial strength of UIHC? Thank you, Regent Parker. What I will do is quickly answer the first one, the follow-up, and, and then, um, and then uh, Kim and Mark, you may want to comment on, on the follow-up of the sustainability and down 
downstream impacts of, of additional costs spent at, um, at North Liberty. I, yeah, I apologize for not making it clear, Regent Parker. It's, it's not additional design work or additional um, uh, uh, construction related to the central utility plant. It's about timing of the completion and activation of the, of the central utility plant and the utilities and the costs for those utilities that will be born before the project, before the hospital project is complete. So it's more about an operations cost in the interim period before the building opens. Additionally, in these value engineering efforts that we've been making, we have been spending time with the designers to refine designs and get them as tight as they can be before um, we bid it and exploring options on that are generally an hourly um, implication on design times. But um, those are primarily the cost. I can, I can get a more specifically line item by line item breakdown of those costs. We, we haven't increased the management fees for the project, for instance. Uh, and in fact, they become a smaller percentage of the overall project than they were before. Uh, by formula, we'd increase those with the cost of the project. But as po was pointed out by Regent Lindenmeyer, if not managing more work, more construction, we, we should not be increasing the management fees to manage that work. Did, did that help to answer that, Regent Parker? I'm still a little unclear, but it, I'm maybe getting, get, maybe, maybe starting to get there. Yeah, so I, I, to, as follow up, I'll I'll have our team put together sort of the breakdown of the uh, line by line uh, elements of planning design management line item, which is a um, it, it ends up being a catch all for a lot of things because there are non construction related project costs, for instance, in testing, testing materials, testing, and other things that are captured in that large line item, and so. We can certainly provide a breakdown of the costs that make up the full forty-seven million. So, right, so right, I'll take the the second part, and, and Kim, after I, I can let you make some comments as well afterwards. Um, my, my thought, um, and I, I appreciate the question. You know, this adds as you allocate out this expense, it's adding eight million or so per year in expenses uh, from depreciation and whatnot. And so that 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 is a challenge. It's still um, even with the eight million, there is margin return from adding this access. Um, so I think that's a key point. And also, um, without this kind of next step within the master facility plan, we're kind of locked in with little to no growth from an OR activity and inpatient bed perspective. So it, it does create a challenge system wide uh, if the step if the step of the next step of the master facility plan doesn't happen. And Kim, feel free to make comments as well. Right, right. That's true, Mark. So uh, when you when you look at our constraints, right, and planning on building North Liberty and taking certain uh, services and providers from the main campus to North, North Liberty, it then allows us to take the space that's vacated on the main campus and then, mod like I talked about, modernize and renovate spaces to add in, you know, more places to care for patients. So just as Mark was saying, if we're not able to move anything off site to North Liberty, then we really are just totally landlocked. And in spite of all of the work that we do, and we'll continue to go with our efficiencies of care, we just um, are are greatly limited in our in our ability to grow. And when you look at um, the, you know, revenues uh, that are generated too by caring for more patients, it's important. It's all interrelated. Um, and so, um, you know, we really believe that North Liberty is an important piece of our um, master campus plan. So if I could just summarize, even if we look at North Liberty in isolation, it's still a positive margin project. And if we look at how it fits into the entire system, it makes even more financial sense. Exactly. Thanks. Uh, uh, Regent Reisberg, 
have a I have a few questions, so I'll just ask them one at a time if that's okay. But um, regarding change orders, when those when those do come in, whether they're unforeseen or scope changes, what have you, are they hard bid or are they time and materials? Yeah, they're well, they're generally time and materials uh, because we're under contract with if it would be in that case related to a subcontractor doing the work, we negotiate the cost for that. We actually initiate it as a an instruction to the contractor, an ITC, where the contractor would then take the scope of work we need to either rectify an unforeseen condition or whatever the case may be. And then they provide for us a proposed or uh, um, cost to, to us for them to deliver that work. And um, it would include their, uh, their overhead as well, but it would be a proposed cost to us uh, that we would review can debate but ultimately um, uh, through our review it would be uh, at their cost plus for um, for delivery of change orders <clears throat> okay and do we limit the uh, margin on change orders to to a certain amount as well compared to uh, the regular project in well they're usually subcontractor plus contractor based we have a management fee that's associated with the competition that resulted in the CM at risk that has overhead costs locked in at a rate, but um, there are other overhead costs. It's not a, it's not a single locked in number. Okay. Uh, any not to exceed numbers? Uh, they, they can pr provide not to exceed, yes. Okay. Um, Excuse me, I'm just looking at notes I wrote down. Bear with me. Sure. Do when are when when do they order the materials? You know, for example, looking at um, furniture and equipment is twenty four million dollar increase. If they ordered that sooner than later, we might get price discounts on that. I know they're beholden to a certain price, but we may be able to take advantage of a lower price if we can get more of that stuff ordered. Now, it also might help in avoiding circumstances where you're ready to open up, but you might not have equipment. Some of the, some of the lead times on some of that stuff can be really long. Yeah, Regent Risewick, you, you bring up a really both important and challenging issue, especially on a project of this scale. One thing to note, the uh, furniture and, and equipment is not part of the CM at risk GMP that is managed internally. And when we're looking at equipment, part of the reason for that are established both um, standards and also needs by UIHC for, uh, you know, we say furniture, it's not just desks and chairs, it's a lot of equipment. And uh, one of the challenges on any project we have when you get to equipment and technology, we often counter, it's counter to, sometimes counterintuitive, especially in a long lead time environment, we tend to want to get those later in the game because they become, um, because there are updates in technology that would suggest if you got it now, it might be needing an update or out of date by the time you'd move it in. So we do, however, have to mon monitor that against lead times. Lead times have never been more extreme than they are now. And it's not just technology and furniture. Right now, there are lead times on roofing systems that are a year and a half when they used to be weeks. And, and so when we talk about ordering materials, JE Dunn will be ordering with their subcontractors, ordering materials immediately because it will be one of the ways to make sure that we get out in front of um, uh, materials wars with others, the, the earlier the better. Um, but with respect to furniture and equipment, we have contracts uh, for some furniture and equipment is very specific and working with them absolutely early on helps us to know lead times and also likelihood of updates so that those that can be ordered early can be and should be for best pricing. But then we also have to watch after storage of those if the building's not ready yet. Wouldn't be good for us to get uh, 400 chairs because it's a little cheaper now and figure out where you're going to keep them when the building's not not opened or able to take them and that's all a manage that's all part of in that management line item and working with JE Dunn to time those elements but you you certainly highlight a challenge especially now with lead times right okay and then what are what are the payment terms um in general 
And do they you, offer quick pay discounts or anything like that? I might ask David Keff to lean in. You're talking with respect to J.E. Dunn and the CM at risk payment. Yes, correct. Yes. Um, it, it, my understanding is this is done just as it would be on a standard delivery project. They, they're, um, we have a schedule of values for the project. We have a cash flow for those, and they bill based on work done and materials received, and so uh, and stored. So, um, in this case, as the project unfolds, we're not paying ahead. Uh, they're not requesting ahead of it being done. Our management team is making sure that each pay application and request is in time with the percentages of the work done for the multitude of schedule of values, meaning parts of the project. Is it, is it, is it 60 days, 120 days from, from receipt of the invoice or do we know? David? Yeah, yeah once the pay apps are received, they're, they're um, reviewed by a whole team of both our construction managers, but also our, um, our accounting group that specializes in um, in construction um, invoices uh, through our, our capital uh, management department, and you, the payout is is a it's a thirty day payout. The the cash flow looks similar to a bell curve. Um, you know, right now uh, it's it's not extensive, uh, but as the building gets you know gets up out of the ground, gets framed, there's more trades groups. Uh, on the project, then the cash flow obviously, uh, you know, increases um, at that time. And then as the project you know, starts to wind down, the cash flow, you know, will, will drop off. Do they offer, I'm sorry for so many questions, do they offer any quick pay discounts? In some cases, they might offer you one to 2% if you pay like net 10 or net three or something like that. Yeah, given this, that we don't typically do that, um, only because of the, the extensive review that we each of those pay apps goes through, it would often take us longer than, um, you know, 10 days to be to be vetting that from a making sure everything is in compliance from an audit perspective. And, and gotcha. all of that. It, it's all sort of, um, these are border region contracts. And so um, it's all spelled out in those in those region contracts, what they can and can't do it. It's not as if at, when they bid on these projects, they bid, you know, special pay terms or anything like that. It's, that that's not how uh, okay. co these complex projects operate. And then just two, two more. Uh, what I assume there's retainage. What, what's the percentage of that? And then I assume there's bonding to performance or bid or both. Yes, there are. David, do you know, I, I'm assuming this is standard by the region's contract as well on the retainage. Yeah, it's state code. Yeah, um, retainage. But what's the percentage? Just curious. It would be a, a five percent uh, retainage, um, you know, on the project. Okay, thank you, guys. Thank you, Regent Dunkel. Thank you. Patient care is very important, but what percent of this facility will be used for research? So when we look at the square footage within the building, it's only about 1.8% of the uh, square footage will be used for research. And then, um, you know, it's important to our mission, but it's important uh, to patient care as well. But you can see it's a very small percent of the, the square footage. I, I have one question uh, that would be probably for Mark. Um, can you confirm to the board that there's no uh, state dollars that are going into this and there's no tuition uh, that's being used to build this hospital? Yeah, I would confirm those points. There's no state dollars or no tuition that would be going to fund this. In, in a general sense, we're just like a nonprofit hospital that is building a hospital. Exactly. It's completely Thank independent you. of the general fund. Exactly. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Very good presentation. Uh, we'll move on with the business part. A motion and a second are required to approve the updated budget as outlined in the agenda item. Is there a motion? 
I so move. Regent. No, Regent Bates and Regent Kunkel seconds. Any discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. Regent Parker? Yes. Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Butker? Yes. Regent Crow? Yes. Regent Risewood? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Rouse? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Is there any other business to come before the board? Hearing none, this meeting of the Board of Regents, State of Iowa is adjourned. Recording stopped.